Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the January 29th, 2024 meeting of the Board of Education's Fiscal Management Committee. My name is Lynn Harris. I am uh, proud and pleased to continue to chair this committee, and I will start by uh, acknowledging and having the folks in the room here doing this work with us today introduce themselves, starting with my colleague to my right. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Julie Yang, District 3. Glad to join this committee. Um, looking forward to our work together. Uh, good morning. Brian Holt, Chief Operating Officer. Good morning. Shannon Pattyfoot, Analyst to the Board. <laughs> Becky Gibson, Legal Secretary to the Board. Um, I'm sorry, Financial Secretary to the Board. Okay, and we will have folks introduce themselves as they join us at the table. Um, first thing on our agenda is uh, inf the informational summary uh, from our November 24th, 2020, or November, November 14th, 2023 meeting. Any concerns, edits, comments to that? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Um, and here we are, it is January, it, it, we are in the midst of budget season. And uh, so the first thing that we will be talking about today is our CIP. Um, Mr. Hall, would that be you? I don't see. So I'm going to uh, respectfully ask if we can move that item down um, and amend it because Mr. Adams does not appear to be. Here. How here. about that? Right on cue. <laughs> wow. Mr. Adams will be joining us at the table. <laughs> He's like pulled a rabbit out of your hat right there. She's like, here he is. All right. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk about the CIP. Um, there's, there's obviously been, uh, you know, a lot of movement in terms of, of county fiscal uh, discussions over the past several weeks to months. Um, what we're seeing now, though, however, is uh, two weeks ago, the, the county executive um, put forward his uh, recommended CIP. And again, that CIP is not just the capital improvements program. It's not just for MCPS. That's countywide. So that's everything from transportation to, you know, libraries, fire stations. Um, so what we're seeing, though, is that while the numbers, I think the 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 description of, of the funding of MCPS, the Capital Improvements Program, doesn't look too bad. I mean, it looks like a reduction of about, um, you know, $100 million over the course of six years. It is the fiscal years that we're really paying attention to. So in the first four years of the board's request, it's a reduction of $346 million. Um, so that's obviously pretty impactful. It's probably one of the largest reductions in, in the first four years that we've seen. Typically, we see a reduction in the first two years. Um, four years is a little unprecedented in, in terms of, of what we're seeing and, and what we're hearing from the Office of Management and Budget is that a lot of this is, is based on lower than anticipated recordation tax and impact tax revenues. I think we talked about that in the fall. CIP is something that we should be watching and paying attention to. That really has come to fruition in terms of um, how that's going to ultimately impact us as, as a school district. Uh, so the, the initial review of, of what these impacts will be um, are, you know, our teams, you know, Ms. Karamias and her team over in budget and, and, and uh, planning, they're looking at a variety of different scenarios. I think one thing I wanted to, to bring to your attention, while wow, this is very preliminary, um, we are looking at it in terms of, you know, moving that, that kind of money out of the first four years is, is really looking at either bigger projects or looking at really broad impacts to our systemics. Um, there's not really what we're seeing is a sweet spot in between where you can just, um, as in years past, maybe move one or two projects. It's either some of our larger, um, larger uh, major capital projects, some of our larger addition projects, or really looking at programs like HVAC roofing over the course of those first four years. Obviously, regardless of which way we go, it's, it's pretty impactful. Um, what we've been saying all along is that this CIP has the least number of projects I think we've ever put in the CIP. Um, you know, obviously we've, we've been battling the inflationary pressures around existing projects and, and so forth, um, but there's just not much in the first four years or even the overall six years uh, to, to move without little impacts. 
So I say that because as we work through um, the course of, of evaluating these budget impacts, we'll obviously be coming back to the board February 27th to do the, the bigger presentation. Um, but between now and then, um, we, we have been requested, uh, I believe Friday, from the Education and Culture Committee to start thinking and producing our non-recommended reductions. Um, and I'll just remind everyone, I know I know most know what those mean, but non-recommended -rec reductions is, is really a, not a great term, but I think it's the best people could come up with. It, it's not going to change the board's request. The board is still going to advocate. You know, we expect the board to still advocate for um, fully funding their, your request. Um, however, you know, in light of the county executive's budget, the county, the county council is asking MCPS to come up with different scenarios um, that could ultimately, you know, align with, with the, the overall budget. Yeah, and I think um, one thing to think that I, the way I have often thought about that is it's just one way for us to be transparent. If this, then that. So we ask for what we ask for. Our CIP request is what it is. But if it's not fully funded, that means we can't take on all those projects on the timeline and being very honest with, with the public about what that will mean, um, practically speaking. And just um, a quick question, just so again, for the uninitiated thousands, millions of viewers right now, um, when we talk, so we talk about, you know, we have a six year CIP cycle. And when we talk about pushing money into the out years, what is that, what is, what is that, why is that something that, that uh, the, the budget folks in the county would would do they say we're fully funding you but sure so um and that's a great question so the the cip you know we, we usually think about it as a big number right uh, you know the board asked for 1.99 billion dollars but that's broken down into the six years um so why when we talk about pushing money in the out years uh, it's really about the different expenditure years so um what the board's request basically you know, entailed was, you know, the first couple of years, we were in the high 400s to 500, um, you know, million dollar of expenditures. The county executive's budget reduces those expenditures the first year by 90 million, the second year by 110, then like 80 and 90, and then adds close to 250 million in the fifth and sixth year of the CIP. So essentially what, what we do in ter terms of trying to balance the expenditures is seeing ultimately which projects, if they were to shift their completion date, do, do, do some of their expenditures shift into that fifth and sixth year. And, and so um, a perfect example, we had a uh, community meeting last week, um, shortly after the county executive's budget out at Damascus High School. Um, we, we changed our approach to talk about the design, to talk about the budget implications, and really just making sure that they understand a project like a Damascus that has, um, its, its budget is, is just about requested at right around $200 million. That $200 million is spread out over basically four and five years. Um, because how it looks at it is in terms of, you know, how much, how much money is basically balancing a checkbook, how much money are you going to spend each year in that construction project? So if, if you're asked to reduce 90 million, 110 million, 90 million, it's not as simple as just moving that project one year, because if you're asked to reduce 90 million and you want to move 90 million to the second year, you're asked to move 110 million out of the second year. So it, it just compounds the situation in terms of trying to sort out how to how to change completion dates, really more more or less change the expenditure schedules of these projects in order to align with the county executive budget. I don't know if that's a, a better explanation of it, but it is basically balancing a checkbook over a six-year period, and the county executive has has found money in the last two years of, of that checkbook and asking us to shift expenditures out into that fifth and sixth year. Thank you. So um, a couple of things, again, I was um, from the, the Damascus uh, High School pr perspective, I think it was very powerful for us to explain um, the process. You know, I, I think what the feedback is, is obviously everyone, you know, does not like to see any potential delays that, you know, any, any sort of changes that, that are swirling out there, you know, you get anxieties. Um, but what was really powerful was just to explain the process. We, we went through and explained that um, starting February 6th is when the county council has their hearings on capital improvement programs. Um, so it's, 
it's ahead of when they will see non-recommended reductions. It's ahead of the board meetings, but it's really important for communities to go out that February 6th and talk about the importance of their projects and, and more importantly, the importance of the, the school uh, CIP as a whole. Um, what, what we talk about is that, you know, what we're seeing in terms of because there's a reduction in recordation and impact tax, um, that, that can obviously be offset by thing, you know, things such as the, the uh, bond dollars. Bond dollars are determined by spending affordability, but, but what we also know is many of the bond dollars as part of the overall county have already been allocated to other projects, have already been allocated to transportation, have already been allocated to uh, fire stations, other, other projects. And not to say those projects aren't important, but when you're talking about a, a large CIP and a large um, deficit of revenue, uh, it's really important for our communities to go out and advocate for, for their facilities. Um, for their projects. Um, what, we've, what we've heard through uh, other council members or other council staff is um, about 50% of the county residents you know, do have students in MCPS schools, so schools are important, but the other half you know, also find, you know, obviously the other infrastructure projects just as equally or if not greater importance. So going out and advocating for, for these projects is, is really important at this time. Um, so we, we have posted, you know, some of this information on our website. I think, um, obviously, as we, as we move over the course of the next several weeks, um, we'll be continuing to push out more information for our communities. Um, you know, but obviously, when we get to that February 27th board meeting where we do our CIP presentation, we'll go over much of this in greater detail. Mr. Um, Adams, um, good morning. So I think it's important for the community to go out, like you say, on February 6th to, um, to advocate. So if someone is interested, how do they let the audience know? How do they find out when to show up, where to show up on February 6th, and how to sign up to, uh, to have their opinions heard? So, so obviously you can go to the uh, county council um, public hearing uh, webpage and, and, and sign up to testify. Um, we're also going to publish this information on our website as well as you know, push this out to all the communities that, that could possibly be impacted. Um, the, the challenge here is it is most of MCPS uh, because you, know, you have projects like Crown, you have projects like Woodward, Damascus that, that involve not only their individual school community project but also the boundary studies that are associated with it and relieving other capacities. It's, it is a much broader impact than just an individual project. Um, the, the challenge, uh, obviously, is some of the systemics. You know, I think we've talked about that. Uh, systemics are equally important. Um, the infrastructure improvements, uh, I think, as a board, you probably hear most of your concerns about um, things like temperature, indoor air quality, ADA, um, sustainability, you know, a lot of those functions, the restroom renovation projects. Um, so while I don't necessarily impact large amounts of individuals coming out and testifying in support of those programs, they are equally important. Um, and and we'll, we'll obviously push that out to our communities and our students so that they understand it. What's, uh, what are the possible implications here around delays? Well, and I would just simply add, um, many of the things that we hear. So if we, we listen to uh, folks that come to the board table with public comment or to CIP hearings, a lot of the things that we hear about very often are those system-wide projects. It is the HVAC issues. It is the roofing issues. It is, you know, the, the restroom renovations. It is those kinds of the ADA compliance issues um, that we hear about most often because those are the things that directly daily impact individual experiences of our schools. So um, even though they are... I don't even know how to say it, less specifically identifiable to people. You know, saying you're going to get an addition to your school or new building, that, that's something that's very, you know, you can, very tangible. But I think I heard you say it not long ago, that you could go to a school and over summer completely um, renovate and put in an entirely new HVAC system. One of our, you know, aging infrastructure projects, and when the when the students and staff come back into that building for the fall, they don't see it, and so it is harder for people to sort of wrap their hands around it. But they do notice it. They do, they do come to us with concerns about it. So, um, and I am concerned that that is one of the things that when we talk about CAP non recommended reductions, that often. Um, get mentioned first are these sort of big system-wide projects that people can't rally behind, you know. 
um, in, in the same way. Um, but I do, I mean, I, I do believe last year when we had to come forward with our, I think we had two rounds of non-recommended reductions with the CIP last year. And the one that the uh, ENC committee, the Education and Culture Committee at the council sort of was like, mm -mm, no, we're not going to do it, Wait, was the, the money for HVAC. They were equally um, concerned about those system-wide projects because they hear, too, from their constituents who um, experience issues. So, um, yeah, I appreciate uh, the, the candor with community around... Um, we are doing what we can do, but here's a way for you to advocate your needs um, elsewhere in in, uh, in a different venue that is uh, going to have a big something a, a big say in the the budget that comes our way. And, and the last thing I would add is this: this truly, you know, we you know, we try to really convey this is not a a blame situation, right? This is not one where it's, you know, this, this group yeah. chooses one or the other. So mm -hmm. um, we have really, really been uh, emphasizing um, those communities that are really uh, interested in getting involved, really understanding the economic development of the county. Mm -hmm. um, when you see some of these revenue shortfalls, it's really important to understand the reasons why um, and, and focus a lot of attention in that area as well. So I just wanted to be clear, we're not, this isn't, you know, the county executive versus yeah. MCPS or the county council. This is really yeah. just the product of economic um, conditions in the county and one that I think uh, many of us, including, you know, our families need to, to pay very close attention to over the next course of the next several years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. And interesting, because I, I, I'm not exactly remembering the quadrennial cycle, but we will be soon, soon coming up on the quadrennial, countywide, um, you know, growth planning, growth policy, we used to call it, I mean, we've called it many things over the years, but every four years, the county does have to take a hard look at the uh, infrastructure impacts on, on our capital budget, and that's mainly roads and schools. So um, it'll be an interesting conversation when this one comes around. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleague? And I did want to mention our, our third member of the of this committee, Mrs. Mondrowski, is not physically here. She is listening, um, and um, so anyway, she's here with us in, in the in the ether. Um, okay, so moving on to the next item on our agenda um, is uh, operating budget, and so uh, this will be an interesting conversation as we are all hot in the, we're, you know, seeing impacts on our FY24 budget ongoing and projecting ahead to FY25. So I will have uh, our, uh, Mr. Riley introduce himself and we will start with a look at an update on our FY24 operating budget. Uh, good morning, Rob Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. Uh, I wish I could say, and now for the good news, but unfortunately I can't. So um, be, uh, next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about our financial monitoring process, but before I do that, I just wanted to give a little time to go through how we determine where we're at and how we project where we're going to be at at June 30th. And we can look at this as a three-step process. So the first step is what is the status of our actual spending at any point in time? And to confirm actual spending, we're relying on our state-of-the-art state cloud-based ERP system, as well as our experienced accountants and other finance staff uh, to make sure that the transactions in the system are properly recorded and that they comply with the rules in our financial manual, are they valid transactions? So we, the first step is to make sure that what's in there is actual, is accurate, and, it, and we're in compliance. At the same time, on a daily basis, our payroll staff in ERSKI, or Employee Retiree Service Center, are busy making sure that we're paying our 25,000 employees timely and correctly. This is another area where staff um, with the introduction of the HCM system, we'll gain some uh, 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 abilities to kind of do things through the system. One of the issues we're facing now, and one of the things that prompted the start of the HCS, HCM system, is that uh, we're currently dealing with an outside system, Lawson, as well as our ERP cloud system. The idea between the HCM is kind of combine the two. So with that, it's going to uh, show improvements in our workflow. It's going to show internal control uh, processes that happen within the system, which is going to benefit finance and all of us um, in, in the end. You're going to be hearing about that later on. Yes. As well, um, too. And for the uninitiated ERP? Uh, Enterprise Resource Planning System. So it's basically like the, the foundation of all the accounting and all the, the systems that flow into accounting. So next step. So based on these actual numbers, uh, 
the chiefs, the associates, and the fiscal staff in our various offices end up looking at their um, where they stand from a budget to actual standpoint. They have the knowledge in these areas, so they're the first ones that take, kind of take a look at that. And through the system, which is also part of the, uh, the first phase, the ERP phase, through the budget system, they're able to input that data. So that gets, um, gets us everybody on the same page and making sure we're looking at the same things. Um, so the, the, <clears throat> the chiefs and the directors and the um, associates within each of these offices, they, they kind of know what services are currently be, being performed and what the plan is for the rest of the year. So they're on the ground, they're, they're being able to tell what their projected year-end balance is. Um, if, if they are aware of any areas or accounts where they'll be going over, in other words, their expenditure is more than the budget, um, they are tasked with letting the finance office know as soon as possible um, and that they have a plan to take care of that negative balance. Not always possible, mm -hmm. um, but I just want to tell you that's part of this process as well, too. Okay. So the final phase. Uh, the office projections come back then to the specialists in the Division of Management and Budget, where they are reviewed and evaluated using expenditure trend analysis. Uh, they're reviewing the encumbrances. They're looking at vacancies and turnover projections to come with, the, uh, with a year-end budget variance by chapter. Uh, this is an important thing that we do because by Comar, we cannot be negative um, in any chapter at the end of the year, nor can we be negative in our uh, unassigned fund balance. So I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. Um, so some of the advantages, as I mentioned, our budget software has been upgraded to the cloud as well, uh, which assists us in moving the, that data. So the final step in, the, in this process is reviewing the projections with the superintendent and the core team to finalize what actually is projected for the chapter variances and the year-end fund balance. Uh, this is the process that MTPS has been using many years, and it also is, uh, feeds into the board's monthly financial report that goes to the board as well as to county council. So it's showing the transparency of where we're at with these different chapters and with our financial monitoring at the time. So a couple of changes. So we are seeing this year inflationary pressure uh, pressures in numerous chapters. So I, I, I mentioned the, the times that uh, folks have to let finance know where they're over. We're seeing a lot of these memos come to finance, as well as this is the first year that we're going to go through our uh, year-end fund balance without our with year-end process without our normal $25 million fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what that means is there was, there's really no room for error. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. So we were talking about the monthly uh, report. This gives you uh, a visual of the report that goes to the board and the county council. Uh, it's a little small, but I just want to walk you through a couple of changes that occurred between November 31st, November 30th, sorry, of last year and November 30th of this year. Mm. Uh, at the February 6th meeting, you will be getting the report where we are at through December. Uh, I'll give you a little preview. It's it's going to be similar to what you see on the right-hand side. Mm. But if you're looking at that left-hand side, uh, we had to go through a couple of uh, accounting reconciliations to come up with a projection of where we were going to end the, the year with the fund balance. As you can see, we start the year with uh, reflecting what the prior year fund balance was. And at the time last year, the, the, the amount was uh, $9,978,579. Mm -hmm. And from that, we subtract uh, any uh, supplemental appropriations. In this case, it was $750,000 for the teacher device choice program. Um, and then we look at, during the year, in this financial monitoring process, we look at what's the projected revenue deficit or overage, and then what's our expenditure balance, uh, which in the past, um, that would always be an overage because, in essence, when we were uh, tasked with saving $25 million to fund the subsequent year's budget, that was in, that was in there. It, it kind of was a, basically a savings account that we had or a, a place where you would go if you ran into situations where there was inflation beyond control. So that shows that at this point last year, we were saying that uh, we'd had $29 million in our fund balance, 25 of it to be allocated to to this fiscal year, and then we had $4 million in unassigned fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, and just, just for the public, so unassigned fund balance, that's basically the bottom line. Fund balance has multiple components, one of which is what a, what a district may or may not use to fund the subsequent budget. And just as an aside, I think there's only one or two uh, LEAs within the state that don't use fund balance to help fund the subsequent year budget. Um, also in assigned bond, uh, fund balance is encumbrances. 
So these are items that cross fiscal years. So if we, if we start a, a PO or, or um, a project in May, those funds are, are, we're able to allocate that funding into the subsequent year because the service is still going on. That project is still happening. So that's an encumbrance. Uh, another area that, that recently uh, became part of our fund balance is our student activity fund. Mm -hmm. So this was an accounting uh, uh, pronouncement that said student activity funds normally are sitting aside and have their own fund balance, mm -hmm. uh, but the decision was made by the accountant, uh, general uh, accountant association that um, we actually have control over that. You know, we set the rules on how that those funds could be uh, spent. So even though they are school funds, they do reside in our assigned fund balance. So that's another component. And then the final, what the bottom line is, what is that unassigned fund balance? And for us, that means uh, that that's an amount that we could use to, if we had to, go to the county council and ask for a supplemental uh, to use to maybe potentially alleviate some of these issues. Uh, so. Uh, that is something that we will be bringing to the board at the next board meeting. We're going to be asking for a supplemental to use some of our previous year fund balance to help the situation in our employee benefit plan. Okay. And I'll get to that. So um, if you look on the right, uh, you can see the math there. It's a lot uh, less complicated without having that $25 million. We show at the top that we had uh, 33 million. We used the 25. Now this year, we're starting this year with an $8.2 million mm -hmm unassigned fund balance. Right. To that, we add what we're projecting for a revenue surplus, which is $6.6 .6, million, and a lot of that is due to interest that we've gained. And then our projected expenditure balance, one million eight hundred and ninety. Very, very small, and we've talked about this in previous board meetings because this financial report comes to the consent agenda. This is uh, very unprecedented. We don't have that $25 million, so that, that's the expenditure balance that we're looking at right now. So if you add those three last items, the eight, the six, six, and the 1.8, we're looking at $16.7 million right now is where we're projecting the end of this year's fund balance to be. That would start FY25, so uh, next slide. All right, so uh, a little more on operating fund balance. So this slide illustrates our five-year operating fund balance history with the orange line representing the unassigned fund balance, which we just uh, spoke about now, um, and the blue line representing the assigned fund balance. So it gives you a visual of what we're kind of looking at going into this year. You can see the, the assigned fund balance for future year's budgets uh, always was traditionally around $25 million. It went up to 35, but now you can see in FY24 it's at zero. The unassigned fund balance, that orange line, basically that's what, uh, that's what we're dealing with right now. That's the situation where we're in. Um, and uh, anytime there's inflation, when you're looking at this, it's going to be an extreme stress on that operating budget. So mm -hmm. next slide. Mm -hmm. Uh, so employee benefit plan. So I talked about uh, uh, budgets under stress. This one certainly is. So um, just to give you a background, so the employee benefit plan actually represents two separate trusts that are outside of the operating budget. One is for the retiree benefits, and that uh, ends up getting reported as our OPEP fund. If you look at our annual comprehensive financial report, you'll see this uh, retiree employee benefit fund. But added to that is what the county contributes to this, this fund. The county contributes are um, what, what is needed for the unrecorded liability in that fund on an annual basis. So um, you'll see that, that that fund, the OPEP fund, is, is actually rather healthy. But we started out as our retiree trust uh, to pay the benefits in that current year. The other part of EBP, when we talk about EBP, is our internal service fund that's used to pay the current benefits for our active staff. So for both these trusts, there's an employer, MTPS employer contribution that comes directly from our operating budget. And that contribution has not been able to keep up with the extraordinary inflation and increased claims in these funds. Uh, not, not to mention, you know, within these funds too, uh, I don't know if you heard in the news, but there's a issue with our GLP or glucagon-like uh, peptide drugs, uh, where those expenses are, are going through the roof. Um, so, so this is something that, you know, we're, another thing that we're dealing with, another stress on this EBP fund. Um, so last year, our annual financial report that I spoke about did actually reflect a negative balance in the active fund, which the finance office has been predicting over the last 18 months. Um, is that critical? 
um, it's certainly a red flag to show that um, if we don't uh, write that, or if we don't rectify that, mm -hmm. we could be in a situation where we're not able to pay the benefits for active or retiree employees. So, so that, that's the issue. That, that's what we're facing. Uh, next slide, please. So another illustration here, this, this slide reflects the year-to-year -year decrease in fund balance and the MCPS contribution to the EBP on a year-to-year -year basis. Although the contribution has been increasing for the past few years, it, it's, mm -hmm. you can see that the 28.7, and, yeah. and in the, this budget too, we are increasing it as well too. Uh, but again, has not been able to keep up with inflation, and thus you're seeing a dramatic decrease in that uh, EBP fund balance. Uh, we are actually saying by the end of this year that would be a negative $35 million. I, I mentioned we're slightly negative now, but it's it's going to be even further. So, um, One of the things that we're doing to address this dire outlook okay. is the expenditure restrictions that we've instituted for the remainder of FY24. However, this is not a permanent or sustainable solution. We are going to need to look at our health care plan design in the EBP fund. Outside of the annual budget process, as for the operating budget, outside of the annual budget process, we have very little ability, as I've been speaking about, to address shortfalls for items that are not in control, such as inflation, uh, and especially without having the ability to uh, go to our now greatly diminished fund balance. You know, as you can see, out of that $8 million, based on the situation we're seeing in the EBP fund, we the need is we're moving $5 million right away. It's not going to be enough to cover that estimated uh, decrease, which is why we're going into this freeze, um, to free up funds that we can use to contribute to the EBP fund. Um, so other areas, I mean, it's it just the way of uh, school funding. Like, we, we have our funding. We have our appropriations from the state. Um, we, have, we know what we're going to get from the county. Um, other than that, we don't have a lot of miscellaneous income that we can um, resort to in situations like this. We have talked, and the superintendent has talked about uh, going back to you know, pre-COVID where we would uh, charge for certain things, mm -hmm. such as summer school, uh, potentially uh, transportation uh, for magnet programs. There's other areas where we can go back to a charge for service method. Uh, you know, uh, obviously not the best situation, uh, but it's something that we have to consider. Because other than that, our only um, resort is to go to these uh, expenditure restrictions, which this is the first time we're doing it in about seven or eight years. But due to these situations, that's, that's the issue that we're facing. So uh, not a lot of good news, but <laughs> I did want to open it up for questions to see if there's... Uh, and actually, can I, can I just comment on the slide before we do? Um, so as you can see, as Mr. Riley talked about, the blue line is the fund balance for specifically for the employee benefits plan. And as you can see, in uh, 19, 20, and 21, it was fairly healthy. And so at that time, the annual contribution that the district was making was minimal and in two years actually negative. We were actually pulling money out uh, of that fund because the fund balance had gotten as high as it is. And so as you can see in 2020, they pulled out 8 million and 21, they pulled out uh, 2.8 million. And then as the numbers started going down, uh, they did increase that uh, contrib annual contribution to almost 15 million one year. Uh, and then uh, in 23, you know, back down to about 2.2 million, and things here started looking pretty desperate. So last year, when we were building the current year budget, um, we saw that this was a concern, and so we added 28, almost 29 million dollars to the fund, which, as you can see, is more than was contributed in the previous five years combined. So uh, we did notice that there was an issue. We did everything we could uh, from a financial perspective to dump money in there to address that. Uh, the inflation has been even faster than we anticipated. And switching, of course, about 12 months ago over to Cigna just put more uncertainty into the equation because we didn't know how that was going to play out. Um, you know, when we did that, we told the board that we would save about $10 million in uh, administrative fees, uh, and we are realizing that savings. So the picture could be even worse, but clearly uh, it is at a point now where we really need to do something about it. And so as Mr. Riley talked about a couple of things, the expenditure restrictions, uh, using some of our uh, very, very limited fund balance of uh, $5 million, but those are all one-time contributions. And so what we really need uh, is to get back to adding you know, I think the finance team uh, said about $40 million per year for each of the next three years to get us back on track because, as you can imagine, without significant intervention, that blue line continues to go down in future year projections. And so uh, we see this as a, a very 
uh, serious matter that needs to be addressed immediately, hence the actions that we're currently taking and the actions that we will ask the board to take with the supplemental appropriation uh, and then adding money to the FY25 budget to address these issues. I, uh, one more thing. Thanks, Ms. Tull. On the, you can see that's $62.5 million. Um, so those were years where, uh, you know, inflation might not have been as bad. Uh, the other thing that, that happened was, at that time, there was a general rule of thumb that the EBP balance should be about $25 million. Obviously, with the cost now, we don't agree with that. So once we get back to a, a normal fund balance, I would suggest uh, trying to maintain a higher fund balance than that. But that's what prompted. We actually did, uh, I don't know if you recall, we did uh, uh, holidays for our employees to, to not pay. So that's, that's some of the things that dropped that 62.5 down to 56.9. And there was, there was a budget year where we actually move uh, contribution funding from that to our pension fund. So we don't want to get into that situation anymore. Obviously, you don't want to have an extreme high, extremely high fund balance um, because the county or somebody's going to say, hey, that's money that you can use for other needs. Uh, but I do think once we get this corrected in the future, we're going to have to try to maintain a little higher fund balance than $25 million because that's not enough to support these dramatic fluctuations. Okay, first meeting, that's a lot of, <laughs> so really. <laughs> okay, all right, so um, one clarifying question. Um, we, you were talking about maybe adding 40 million into this employee um, e EBP fund. Um, remind me, in our tw FY24 budget, have we included this 40 million? So FY24 being this current year, the budget that we're working on now for FY25, uh -huh. uh, there is 20 million included in there. So there is 20, but it's not the 40 million you are recommending at Correct. the moment. Okay, thank you. Then, um, so my um, other question will be, clearly we are all looking for solutions. Um, you mentioned that we have already done spending restriction, we have put $5 million into, and you are thinking for this year going to ask special appropriation from the county council. Now, looking into the next year, um, if it's only half, $20 million is included in the superintendent's recommended budget, then we might find ourselves in this position again. Am I, am I Yeah, um, the fact that it's 20 and not 40, we do run the risk that we could be back here at this table a year from now um, saying the same thing. Okay. And I understand that we as a system has put out an employee survey um, for um, uh, to see feedback on our experience, our employees' experience with Cigna. Can you tell me what's the intention of putting out that survey? Yeah, so we heard when we did make that transition, uh, it's mm -hmm. been a year now, July, I mean, January 1st of last year. Mm -hmm. We did hear a lot of feedback um, from our mm -hmm. folks. Some of it was that um, they weren't able to get their um, doctors that they had within mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. um, the data that we were showing uh, in, in our RFP, the vendors that competed for this had to guarantee that there'd be 95% coverage of you know, your existing doctors to have within that network. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing it's actually 98%. Um, but with that said, we're still um, hearing from folks that had issues. So, yeah. um, so our, our new vendor, Cigna, does uh, do an annual survey, which will be coming out soon. Mm -hmm. We felt it was more important uh, or just as important for us to send our own survey to hear from folks. We, we kind of went through that process with our associations. Mm -hmm. We developed, uh, I think it was about a 13-question survey, yeah. which we just got back in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually going to sit down with the associations and go through those responses. Mm -hmm. And we, we had comment section as well there, too. Mm -hmm. So we had about a 30% uh, rate of, uh, you know, folks filling out their survey, That's which is, I hear is excellent for surveys. Yeah, very, very um, and a lot of people did fill in comments. So mm -hmm. as for the question about, you know, what we can do, um, if some of those are related to service or how well we respond, you know, mm -hmm. we can address those. Um, the contract is a three-year contract okay. currently with, with Cigna. Okay. Um, so, um, 
you know, if, if there's general satisfaction, we have to, you know, look at that. Mm -hmm. We are planning on when that three years runs up to, you know, go out for another RFP as well, too. And that, to be honest, that's going to be here before you know it. We're already going to be in the middle of this year. And that RFP process we'd go through with the uh, associations, too. Mm -hmm. um, they have the ability to kind of look and, and confirm, which they did for the previous one for Signet 2, and everybody was on board. Uh, but we kind of walked them through and have them look at that process as well, too. It's really an MCPS process, but we feel it's good for transparency to have of the course. associations in on that as well. Yeah, so the reason I asked the question is I'm trying to see if it's um, budget motivated for the survey, but it sounds like it's more serviced uh, uh, oriented survey, right? But um, if we are already about halfway with this three-year contract, um, what are the other insurance pricing landscape out there? We have realized nine or $10 million savings with Cigna, but now after the inf inflation, after this period, what what is the market looking out there? I want to have an understanding. And that is part of that RFP process, which we'll you know we'll we'll look into when, when the when the bid goes out to the street. Um, okay. You know when we did uh, uh, award Cigna, mm -hmm. there was significant savings, as Mr. Hall mentioned, to the mm -hmm. tune of ten or eleven million dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to, to the next competitor, the other competitor was even higher. Right. Um, so, it in a way, this the decision was prompted by economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but that, that's going to help us um, in our decisions or maybe how we frame those questions in the next RFP. Okay. So just to directly, I mean, just, you know, my colleagues and I are hearing from various people with concerns around um, some of the actions we're taking to address what we're seeing. Um, as we move through FY24. So uh, first, could you address uh, what there is a perception out there that it is because of the switch to Cigna that we are um, seeing the pressure on our um, employee health trust fund? Uh, no, that's not the case. We are realizing savings in administrative fees. Um, I think what caught us by surprise was the uh, the amount of claims, so it's, it's the, the usage as well as uh, increases in rates, too, that caught us by surprise. But it, um, if we didn't switch to Cigna, I would have been here six months talking to you about this situation. And can I, so I think, you know, in talking to Aon, who's our benefits administrator and kind of helps um, advise us on this, you know, these really complicated matters, um, there are three cost drivers that they've identified. One is an increase in claims. People are just using the insurance and going to the doctor more. Uh, the other is uh, some of these new drugs uh, that Mr. Riley talked about that, you know, like any new drugs, when they first come on the market, they're very expensive. Um, and then the third is inflation. And so, you know, our previous contract was entered into uh, pre-COVID, and so we were locked in to those pre-COVID rates, and the doctors were locked in um, with uh, care first in those, you know, everything was pre-COVID. Obviously, over the past three years, we've seen a huge amount, uh, almost an unprecedented amount of inflation, at least in recent times. Uh, and so when we switched to a new provider, when our contract was up, regardless of who we went with, we were going to see a significant increase in inflation, this pent up inflation that had been building for over three years that we hadn't realized, we realized it all at once. And now I will say that Aon, our benefits administrator, could have and should have done a better job of giving us a heads up that, hey, you, you will see the savings in administrative fees, but no matter who you go with, because things have, the landscape has shifted so significantly uh, significantly since before COVID that you're going to see significant price increases. And so uh, that's an area that um, we'll be working with Aon to make sure that, you know, they're giving us um, timely and uh, accurate information as a heads up going forward because, you know, we don't want to find ourselves in this position ever again. Yeah. And um, so, and then that gets to my next question. There's a, you know, some out there saying, well, you, why weren't you paying attention, MCPS? And, you know, as somebody who who does, you know, a deep dive on every monthly financial report, one of the things that I have always appreciated is that you do forward project the good news and the bad news. I mean, um, so, but I would just put that to you. They're saying, this is MCPS, why didn't you know? Why didn't you, uh, why weren't you paying attention to this? Why are we in this position? And you know, I think part of the issue is, if you recall, two years ago, we had the number $30 million for our EBP. 
when we went through the budget deliberations and we, you know, that, because it's so high, that's a big target on that. So anything we ask for that's not student related um, has, a, has a target on it, to be honest. I mean, so these are areas where um, we're in competition with, with the needs of the students. Um, although I can make a case that um, making sure that we can recruit and retain the best quality staff does affect students as well, too. And that's the situation we're in. We want to make sure that we can keep paying these uh, benefits as well, too. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, too, as Mr. Hall mentioned, um, one of the things that makes a, uh, a little more difficult for us, too, is when we do see spikes in, in inflation and rate increases, um, we do, as an employer, um, MCPS pays either 83% or 88% of those costs. So we can, and we do every year, we'll, we'll pass on those increases to the employees as part of our annual, it's, we do this before open enrollment, um, but we are bearing the brunt of the, the, the majority of that cost increases. So that's another area with, where it makes it harder to um, keep up with it, especially in these uh, large inflation times. And can I just add also, um, as I mentioned earlier, when we did see this, you know, when we were building the budget uh, for this current year, 12 months ago, uh, and we put almost 30 million into the budget for EBP. And if you remember last budget year, that was very difficult. And we had to move things over to ESSER. And so we really fought to make sure that we were able to put as much money into this EBP account as we could, which is why we were able to put almost 29 million in and why we're not in an even worse situation. I'll also say, you know, each year, and it's a big thing when we come to open enrollment each year, uh, the cost increases that our employees bear. And if you remember this past fall, we passed on about a 9% cost increase to our employees. And of course, no one is ever happy about that, but insurance and health costs get more expensive each year. So we, we did pass on the 9% that Aon had recommended, so we, we went with their recommendation, uh, increased by 9%. The actual inflation we're seeing is closer to 13%. And so again, you know, we uh, do, did our due diligence by making sure that we put as much money in there as we possibly could last year, followed the recommendations of our benefits administrator to increase the rates by 9%. Unfortunately, um, they've increased even, even faster than that. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and I appreciate that um, because um, you know, and just to be clear, so like you said, Mr. Riley, the money to keep our employee health trust fund healthy so we can pay the, the health claims as they come through of our, of our employees um, is a, it's a non-student focused expense of the public school system. So where's the target? So how does that play into for the FY25 operating budget? We may get to this in a minute. But um, you're saying we, we need to aim for, you know, putting $40 million forward for FY25 into this fund to help us autocorrect. Have we done that? No. We we put the $20 million in, um, and again, it was trying to get to a certain number with the overall budget and, again, the competing interests. So we need 40 We're asking for 20 Yeah. And yeah, and let's just be clear that that's the landscape that we op are operating in. Um, and also, you know, we are the largest employee in Montgomery County, one of the largest employees in the state. So um, doing what we need to do, to keep the fiscal house in order so that we can continue not only to fund schools and the work that we do for students, but also for our employees. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, so I do appreciate that because, you know, again, we're hearing from um, some of the employee and so associations com, um, who are upset about the, the spending freeze. Um, and again, that is directly related to our ability to want to be able to continue to fund the employee health benefits. Um, and um, yeah, and I do, um, and I do appreciate Mr. Hall's comments about, you know, um, working with Aon and making clear to them we would like to see some, although, I mean, you could survey 100 economists looking over the past four years, and I mean, ha what percentage of them would have gotten all of this right? I don't think very many. It's, 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 it's you know, it's tough to, inflation, it's, it's, it's hard to predict, but we are definitely feeling those pressures in all aspects of our budget. Um, okay, and I think, I think, um, Ms. Mandrowski, uh, although we can't see her visual, um, may be able to unmute if she has any questions. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Harris. Um, 
I have a couple questions. Actually, you and Ms. Yang pretty much asked all of my questions, but I did have some additional questions in terms of growing our fund balance and what the, um, you know, for years uh, we've been using our fund balance uh, as a supplemental when necessary. And I've often heard from the county council about, you know, you use your fund balance up and ask us for a special appropriation. Um, can you explain to me sort of both sides of the thinking on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, this is something when we were doing our, our budget deliberations last year, um, it, the message I was getting is, hey, we're going to uh, tell you, don't save that $25 million. Don't worry about it. We got your back. Um, in my mind, that does that mean that, hey, we're in a situation here, county council, we need another $40 million. I don't see that happening. Um, I see it pointing at us as like, how do we do, how do we fix this? So my, when they say that we can uh, ask for a supplemental, it's been always my interpretation that what we're doing now, we're using that unassigned fund balance, which is money that, that's held aside for the purpose of the, of the school district uh, when we need it. Um, I don't see them coming out with adding additional monies outside of the budget process um, to kind of right this wrong or, or um, make us whole in that respect. Um, they did say, if, you know, I, I think at one meeting I said, you know, if, if, if we're in such a cash crunch, it could affect us making payroll. And they said, don't worry, you know, we'll, I, I could see them making short-term loans. I don't think it's financially prudent for us to be in a situation where um, we're constantly asking the county to, you know, for short-term loans, basically. And I don't think that's going to fly well with our external auditors as well, too. Um, it, we're not the only ones facing this situation. Other school districts, most of the other school districts are seeing, like Mr. Hull said, that 12 to 14 percent increase. They're all facing it different ways. Uh, one of them, a few years ago, actually went way negative, and they had a bad audit report, which, which did um, affect them. Um, it could, there's actually implications. It could affect your uh, state and local funding if that continues. So uh, it's a road that I don't really want to go down. Um, I know that they said they'd, they'd offer it to us, but I think it's something that we have to address as a system. Even though we're an agency of them, you know, we are um, self-supporting. I mean, I, I don't see that as a solution in my mind. And, and can I just add, to um, that... If we were to end up in that position uh, where we had to go back and ask for that, not a position that we would want to be in, again, that would be one-time funding. A supplemental appropriation would be one-time funding, and we really need this baked into our base budget um, because it continues to grow each year. And so addressing it with a one-time payment would address the current year, but it would, we would still be in the same long-term predicament. And so uh, hopefully we don't end up in that situation at all, but certainly even if we did, we still would have to address it through additions to the base budget. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, and generally for growing our fund balance, it's based on um, employees' positions that we haven't been able to fill or someone who's left um, sooner than we, you know, retired or something sooner than we expected. Am I correct in that? Yes, you are, you are correct, Mrs. Mondrowski. And we refer to that as lapse in turnover. And that was right. the tool that we used when we were, you know, working to get that $25 million. Um, if you look in your most recent uh, monthly financial report, and, and generally that would be in our category three, um, only because that that's the you know, by far the largest cat, uh, category we have. Um, it's not a case where we're, uh, we were stopping hiring people because that, and it's not a case where we were taking money away from teachers by, by moving that at the end or be, by, it's just that's where that 25 million resided, to be honest. Um, but um, that, uh, we've, ad we've addressed that. So we've, uh, we've adjusted our lapse and turnover assumption, and that's why you're seeing that our category three as of right now, or the, the report you're going to get in February, um, is going to be close to zero or negative. Never happened before, ever. Okay. That, I appreciate that. And then my only other real question, um, Ms. Yang sort of touched on, and it was really about um, the when, you know, how long our contractor was with signet before we were able to put out a new RFP and whether or not we've really incorporated some of the issues that we're seeing now, you know, we hear from lobbyists and all those people all the time and um, just making sure that when we put out the RFP, we are really looking 
at what companies are willing to do on an ongoing basis as opposed to a one-time upfront savings. Yeah, that's a good point too, too, that we will, uh, you know, during the next RFP, we will make sure that we're fully cognizant of that. I mean, we were, we know some of this, the, the admin fees are, um, they are gonna, you know, we, we realized $5 million in savings there. Next fiscal year, it's gonna go down to three or four. So that, that was being phased out, um, but it is something we'll look at long term too as well. Another thing that we have to do before we get to that RFP process is look at our plan itself. Um, the question is, is our plan too, too rich, too beneficial for employees. I hate saying that because I'm an employee, uh, but at the same time, we want to use our employee benefit plan as a tool to recruit and retain the best. Are we beyond that point? You know, we, we should be at a point where we're um, recruiting folks competitively. We don't have to be much further than that because the more lucrative or the more rich our plan is, the more it's going to cost us in the long run. Right. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I've had many conversations with employees over the years who have commented on how incredibly generous, especially our health plan is. Um, and I, I just remember talking to a teacher who was now a, a retiree, saying in his immediate family, in, during his you know 25 years in, as an employee in the system, I think he said three members ha ha went through cancer diagnoses and treatment. And he said, big picture, out of pocket, they were less. That it was over that time, you know maybe a couple thousand dollars. That is how generous our health plan is. And um, I think people forget that because people only want to talk about things often when they are not happy about things. Um, but that, but I, and I appreciate you saying that just very bluntly and directly. Given our economic, where we are fiscally, are we, is it a conversation we're going to have to have about employee benefits being less generous? Um, and I hope, I hope that we don't, because as you mentioned too, we do want to be, um, very competitive when it comes to um, attracting good talent. And be less generous and still the best, in my mind. Yeah, oh, okay, <laughs> good to know, and you would know. Um, but but and as it gets to our point, we were talking about lapse and turnover um, in Mrs. Madrowski's question, and I know we've had this conversation many times in that when we put together an operating budget for the, for the coming fiscal year, we budget for what we need personnel-wise, even when we look at historic trend data that tells us we are, are very unlikely to be able to fund all of those positions, especially in very high demand um, areas where, you know, s demands very much exceed supply across systems, uh, in systems all across the country, special educators, um, uh, mental wellness staff, you know, uh, licensed clinical social workers and the like, but yet we put them in our budget because that's what we need. Um, and I have seen this year as we're going through the operating budget for FY25 that we are doing more of a look at, we know this is what we need. We know looking at trend data and current employment tr and, and the current employment landscape that we are not likely to get these positions filled yet we need the services. So we're looking at another thing people criticize us for. Why are you, you, you providing, you know, budget budgeting for contract services? And that's, that's the thing, is we need the services. We know we're not going to be able to hire people to do the work. So, you know, we're just trying to be realistic, especially where we are fiscally right now, needing to be, because I know, uh, Mr. Riley, you and I have had this conversation, you know, losing sleep at night, seeing that ending that the year closer to zero than we ever have. And um, I just appreciate the work it's done to really keep, keep the eye focused. And I, I do want to chime in here. I think as a system, we have absorbed a lot of costs in the past years um, due to uh, you know, societal issues such as uh, mental health that is on top of our traditional cost, right? The counseling, uh, the, the mental health counseling. And I think this is where um, I, I I think as a system, we need to evaluate that um, how much we can as a system just alone to absorb these costs and how much because this is a, a larger issue in the society that we need the partnership of, uh, of county government and other agencies. So the fact that we have to move the social workers and psychologists and counselors 
and uh, other contracted services into our operating budget, I have to be honest. I think that that could have been absorbed by other agencies in the county to help us offset that cost because that is not traditionally in our budget because that means we have less money in terms of uh, instruction, right? That, that helps with our instruction, but that has less money going to other area which we have traditionally covered. I just want to put it out there that we can't continue on this pattern of whenever there's a new uh, issue that the school system have to absorb the cost of helping our students and family, right? Uh, very, uh, another issue the same, like we all talking about food insecurity. We all want to do the work to provide meals, healthy students, you know, have meals so that they can learn better in our school, in our buildings. But whatever initiate, initiative there is, uh, full funds alone is not enough. There is a manpower cost to providing all these services too. So whatever new initiatives that we have, it needs the complete partnerships of all the, uh, of the whole society, the whole community. So I, I really want us in our future budgets um, to, um, to talk more about um, what we can do what we need help doing. And we, we, we can't endlessly add to our portfolio the things, the money management portfolio for the things that we have to pay for within our allotted budget. So thank you, Ms. Yang, for that comment. Um, that is very true and, and, and rings very true. Um, you know, as we talked about when we did the first budget work session, when we look at our budget on a per student basis, which really is uh, the best way to look at it as far as what we can actually afford to purchase, because of course we have the largest budget of any district in the state, we're the largest school district. But when you look at it on a per student basis and when you adjust that for inflation, uh, we're actually funded at a lower level now than we were 15 years ago. And 15 years ago, no one was talking about having psychologists and social workers working for a school system. So that, um, the just pure inflation that we've seen across the board, um, the impacts of the blueprint that are not fully funded by the state of Maryland, all have put incredible, and then the Esser Cliff, you know, this federal money, uh, again, we've got $130 million budgeted this year that won't be there next year. So all of this combines to put incredible pressures, not just on our uh, operating budget, but as Mr. Adams talked about, um, the similar, many similar pressures on our CIP and our capital budgets. And so as we, as we look forward, um, you know, I think people need to understand that this is a different time in a different place uh, than uh, it has been in the past. And as we look at our capital budget, I think, you know, focusing on some of these systemic projects, HVACs, instead of building brand new schools, is just going to be our reality, maintaining what we have currently. Uh, and the same thing in the operating budget. You know, what can we, as Ms. Yang said, what can we truly afford in our operating budget and where do we need to seek assistance? So I, I appreciate that comment. Yeah, um, and I will so um, go back to see if Mrs. Mondrowski has any other questions before we move on. No, not really. I just wanted to kind of second what Julie was talking about. Okay, thank you. So I think we kind of combined both the current FY24, where are we, and the outlook for FY25. Yeah, I meant to say that yep. it's going to be a combination. Yep, and so now we are ready to move on to um, the... Uh, talking about our sustainability work, um, very work very close to my heart and to the students of Montgomery County Public Schools who are quite uh, quite passionate um, climate warriors. All right. Good morning, and thank you for having us come speak with you this morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about three of our major projects that we've got ongoing. We've talked about some of these before, but just give you a little bit more detail. First, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Lynn Sarate. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Compliance with Montgomery County Public Schools. Okay. And I'm here with Seth Adams, who is our um, Chief of Office of Facilities and Management. 
Okay, so this morning I'm going to uh, give you an update on our energy savings performance contracts. Um, we are very close on Wednesday of this week. We are going to be closing our loan with Bank of America to be able to fund these projects. But the important thing, and as we're talking about all these fiscal considerations, is that as we do these projects, we're actually going to be reducing our utility use. So we're looking to basically contain future year's costs, right? Because if we use less of these commodities, we won't have to pay as much. So it's a way to basically hedge ourselves against those rate increases that we know are coming. They will still come, but we won't have to pay as big a chunk of them. So that's why these projects are so, so important. So as a refresher, um, we started off with our first 50 schools. We contracted with two companies to do this work. Over the next two years, we will be doing more than 240 projects in total at these 50 schools. Now, the projects all vary in scope and size. Some schools only have three projects. Some schools may have eight projects, but some of the projects might be really tiny or really big. Um, we are doing some HVAC improvements at three of our facilities. We will do these projects over the next two years. And then for the next 18 years, we will pay back that loan that we're taking out with Bank of America from the savings in the utility costs over the next 18 years. And it's a guaranteed savings in our contract with these companies. So if something doesn't work quite the way they said it was going to work, that company will have to come up with the money to pay back that loan. So it's very exciting. Um, stressful week, but we're going to get through it. We're going to get it done. We're going to get them launched next month. And then as soon as we have them launched, we will move on to the next batch of 50 and keep going until we get through the whole school system, having audited all of our schools for these types of improvements that we can fund moving forward. Any questions on that? Yeah. And just let us know. Um, so we've done the first 50. And uh, what is the timeline for getting through the next 50, the next 50, the next 50 until we hit all 200 and... My target 11, is 212 after next yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> Our target is to be through all of them by that 2027, um, the end of 2027 goal. Um, of course, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of contracts in place and that kind of stuff that we have to. But that, that's that's our general philosophy is that we need to be done with this before 2027 is over, because that's our first target for our 80 percent reduction in our greenhouse gas consumption. Yeah, and this is other work, and we've talked about this work a lot because I, I think it is so incredibly important, and it gets to so many of the things that that our students, that staff, that 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 you know, environmental advocates out in the community have been advocating for. Um, but again, this is work that you don't see. And so, one thing I would say is I hope that we are going to be very, um, very clearly maybe partnering with our very talented students who are in, great at communicating and graphic design and things like that to, to, to share with communities these, what the, where these 240 projects are what, and what they will be. But can you share just a little bit, how, what were the factors that went into choosing the first 50 schools? So you fund this based on how much money you can save, right? So we didn't want to pick all new schools because there wouldn't be that much we could use. We didn't want to pick all old schools because there'd be too much work to get done. Right. So when we looked at the whole school system, we looked at the data that we had, we looked at um, things like geography, we looked at population, we looked at type of school. Um, There's a factor of probably maybe 20 different things that we looked at. Um, we looked at farms rates and we wanted to make sure that each 50 included a basically a representation of the whole school system. Um, so I'll admit we, we went with the ones that have really good utility data. We'd be really strongly be able to support all these savings since it was our first way around. We wanted to make sure we had good data. Um, and so that's basically what we did to pick it. We had the auditors go through every single school and every single school they identified, okay, this is a list of things that we could do. And then here's the list of the things that we have enough money to fund out of that self-funded savings opportunity. So we know that there's a lot more we could do if we had more money, we had more grants. And of course, we're looking for more grants to do more stuff. Um, but the original selection process was to have a representative cross-section of the county. So that's what we'll keep doing moving forward because you need to be able to have the funds to be able to fund the projects in the other schools. The other piece of this, too, is just as we talked about earlier in the capital improvements program. So if you're going to make an infrastructure improvement, you, you really need to understand where that, where that overall facility fits within the capital improvements program. So if we have schools that we're anticipating doing possibly even a complete renovation or tear down in the next several years, it's probably not a good candidate for this one because you don't want to invest that money up front and then you know, not be able to, to see it fruition in terms of the energy savings. So it has been a, a balancing act here. Um, and as I, I think as we get into the next 50 then, and then beyond that, it's probably going to become more and more challenging to, to find the right perfect schools. But I think, uh, you know, we're this 
first um, this first grouping was a really good lessons learned for us, and I think we're definitely going to translate that into the next um, 50 and then beyond from there. Yeah, and I'll just um, say again what I said at the time when you presented the um, uh, preliminary plans for the new Burtonsville Elementary School. Um, how much I appreciate that, you know, that's coming online as a net zero building. And so, you know, that is something to celebrate that we are really inculcating this, the county's climate action plan goals, our sustainability policy promises into action here. And that is, uh, and again, you don't always see it, so. I'm wondering, Mr. Hall, in our overall budget, do you know a rough number, what percentage or how much is the like utility costs to keep our buildings running? I do not have that number off the top of my head, but I'm guessing that Ms. Alfonso Windsor might. It's about $47 million. $47 million. Okay, okay, so, and that, so that is a very big chunk of money if we can, we can um, do some savings on that uh, with our work, that would be really great, yeah. Yeah, and before we move on, I'll just ask if Mrs. Smodrowski has any questions. Sorry, I'm having trouble unmooting. Um, no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, all right. So the next topic I wanted to talk to you about is our solar program. As you may recall, we have 17 schools that already have solar on them. With the energy savings projects that we're doing, we are actually going to be able to have a brand new model moving forward. In the past, what we've done is have something called a power purchase agreement, where we allow the company to come in and build their solar equipment on our roof, and then we are purchasing solar from them at a reduced rate. With these two projects under the energy savings performance contract, we will actually be owning these solar panels and paying the energy company to help us maintain it and operate it. We don't have the internal capacity to do that, um, but because of the new federal tax credits that are out there, this is actually financially um, lucrative for the first time. So we're trying something brand new with these two new schools. Uh, so those will come online in the next two years. In addition, um, you may recall we were already working on eight rooftop systems. In addition to those 17, we're working on expanding eight. That is in the signature process right now, and um, the contractor is ready to go get those up on the, on the schools. We also um, have two off-site places where we're going to buy off-site solar, and that will take care of eight of our schools. So, um, and if we use less energy, maybe it'll take more than eight. Um, and so we've got a lot going on with solar. Um, once we get through, once we once we initiate those eight that we were just start talking about working on, we are going. We actually just finished a um, study for decarbonization for MCPS, and we've already started looking at the next batch of schools that we want to put out um, for an RFP for a power purchase agreement for the next batch of eight. So, or it may be more than eight, something like that. Um, I, working through those those details somewhere around in the neighborhood of eight to ten but um, we we continue to um, want to expand solar as much as we can uh, we want to make sure that the buildings are obviously using as little energy as possible we're actually even working with the consultants um, that are designing the buildings now so that we can maximize the solar production once they're built which is something really new and exciting moving forward because we hadn't done that in the past any questions on our solar program Yes, I actually do. I, I want to get some clarification. So we have 17, which is uh, we, we, do we own those solar panels? We, we do, no, we do not own those we solar do panels. We do not, but we purchase. We allow them to put it on our building. Correct. And we purchase at a lower rate. Much reduced rate, Okay. Yeah. Now you are switching, does it mean you're switching this 17 or no, you no, switch no. to the future one? Or seven existing stay. contracts. Okay, Correct. so the future one, the eight new ones is? The eight are also a power purchase agreement. Okay. That vendor is coming in and doing all the work and we're buying the, the solar at a reduced rate from our current electric rate. The two that we're getting under the energy savings performance contract will be owned. So we, So the eight, when they come in, do we own the solar panels or no, we, we don't? No, that's a power purchase agreement for 20 that years. That is a not also a power purchase agreement. Correct. Okay, and the, for the two that's coming up, we will own the solar panels and we pay them to manage? We're going to pay them to, yeah, basically help us operate it, make sure it's working. Um, they're going to do all the servicing, anything that would break, they would fix it, okay. that kind of thing. Ooh. And that's included in that energy savings contract, in that performance guarantee that we already 
talked about where we're, we're taking this loan and we're going to pay it back over the next 18 years. And so that's already included in that cost analysis. So the second one, the, the one that we are going into the two new one that we own, you find that's a better uh, financial model for the school system? Um, we wanted to see, have the experience of owning it and seeing if it was a better financial model. Um, I think we've got to get into it and weigh the pros and cons of both of them. Um, we've just never done it before, and it was something that some other school districts have done and found success with, and so we thought it would, it would definitely be interesting to try. It, it, it does make fiscal sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think when you, um, when you look at the purchasing agreements, I mean, these companies would not be approaching us in terms of if it did make fiscal sense to be able to operate solar panels on our, on our buildings. Mm -hmm. The one big change has been the, the, the passage of, of law to allow a governmental agency to take advantage of, of more incentives. Mm -hmm. Before that, only private companies could mm -hmm. take advantage mm -hmm. of those, those rebates or other tax breaks or other incentives that made it very advantageous for them. As we're starting to see more and more um, legislation that is introducing the opportunity for us to take advantage of it, that's where it does make sense. So as we talked about, I think even at the the last budget meeting, mm -hmm. the idea about us transitioning into owning and operating and some of the challenges just with our workforce around getting them up to speed, this is going to be a great opportunity to bring a third party in to help us mm -hmm. and then start to bridge the gap. But we do think, um, you know, provided that those incentives exist in the future, that this is going to be a, a very advantageous approach for us to own and operate um, solar panels in the future. Mm. So 17 plus 8 plus 2, and we're talking about 27. In, uh, in when would the 8 or 2 come into play? At the, so the, in the 2 front? will be done within the next two years. Okay. Uh, the 8 should be online by the end of this year. Okay. Those are fully designed, ready to go. Uh, materials are ordered. We're just trying to get these contracts executed in good enough weather to get it done. With the 17... Um, solo programs that we currently have, do we have a number of what kind of saving we are realizing? We're actually doing an analysis of that, <clears throat> that right now. I have a um, consultant looking at that for me. Um, but so every year there's an escalation on some of the contracts and some of them there aren't. So I can come back to you with that number. We're, we're looking at current data right now. I would I really appreciate yep. that. Of course, when we're talking about solar program, we're not just looking at the savings. We are also looking at its environmental impact, mm -hmm. but it would be good to have the, the economic data, too. Mm -hmm. I, I would say one thing that um, as we gain momentum, the off-site solar is something that we, we really need to explore. I know that's something that we looked at um, probably 10 years ago. And some of our neighborhoods, some of our communities were a bit opposed to the idea of having, you know, large solar installations um, in some of our properties. But it is something that, as I think we, we continue to gain momentum, um, particularly as we, we strive to meet the, the, the board's sustainability policy, it is something that um, we're, we're going to need to spend a little time with our communities to socialize that idea. Um, and, and, and bring that along a little bit. So there's, there, there are opportunities, but um, I think that from the past that was a little bit of a, an opposition to that type of approach, but I think it's a different time now and something that we'll certainly continue to explore. I believe the county has also talked about using the air reserve uh, to put in some solar panels because of the vast av availability of the of the land, and when I was aboard this summer, I was uh, in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and when I was taking the train from the airport into the city, I noticed along the train track, it was all solar panel along the train track all the way in, and it was an uh, impressive uh, sight to, to see. There are, there are some complex regulations around it, but um I think one of the most important things is that, you know, we, we still have to continue to reduce our existing energy use. Um, we also know that moving forward, the construction codes actually require us to be getting some clean energy. And so where we don't have the rooftop space ability and we don't have the canopy ability to get, generate on site, we will have to have that contract for the offsite. Um, some of the projects that are coming up moving forward, I've already, um, you know, placeholded in that contract that we're going to be 
um, generating some offsite energy to be able to support that school, and that's required as part of our permitting process. Just to be clear, so where are the two projects that um, we are going to own? Where are they based on the energy savings performance contract? Oh, the two schools are Germantown Elementary School and Martin Luther King Middle School. Okay. And um, the off-site solar, what are we thinking about for locations for these? Those locations, um, one of them's built and ready to come online any day. It's in Upper Marlboro. They're both in Upper Marlboro. Um, since they're part of the PEPCO grid, we can we we actually have a sublease that um, we, we sublease that property, and then we have the um, ability to transfer our energy because it's all in one big grid. Yeah, and I think it is important to reengage communities in this conversation because um, um, you know this is the way of the future, and I do also appreciate that you're emphasizing. And I know we've had these conversations um, many times over the years, um, Mr. Adams, but. Um, it's not just moving to purchasing clean energy, it's reducing our consumption of energy. Um, both of those things need to happen. So I do appreciate that we're, we are not just looking at one thing. Um, and, I, and, I, um, and just for how many schools are we looking at doing the uh, canopy um, instead of the rooftop? Because I know roof, rooftop installation can be challenging. So right now we're only working on a pilot at one school. Um, canopies can be much more complicated. They're actually, depending on the site, they may be much smaller production. The one that we're looking at is actually smaller production than what's available on the rooftop, but it supplements the rooftop. They also require some significant structural supports that are very, very expensive in these days of construction with steel as pricing going up. Um, so they're, they're considerably more expensive than rooftop units. But we're, we're working on this one pilot. Um, it's been technically complex to get it designed, so we're still working through those designs. Okay, and I would just mention, you know, the, all of these things we're talking about, they are not new. You know, I know there, there are places, especially in the upper um, uh, west side of the county that have had huge parking lots full of these canopies for a decade. And I know several community colleges in Maryland, same thing. All of their parking structures are under those, those solar canopies, so it's not new technology. And, um, the, and I just think about um, out near Lake Needwood, right off Needwood Road, you can see there's a huge area of, of just of solar. There's the big solar panels and an installation there. Um, so this is, this is the way forward, and I do appreciate that we are, we are really looking at uh, a multifaceted approach. And the last topic I wanted to talk to you about really quickly was just to give you an update on our urban farm project at Loiterman Middle School. The Memorandum of Understanding with CKC Farming is underway. Um, the county is actually a very big partner in this too. They're actually providing some grant funding to CKC Farming. Uh, we have a groundbreaking activity scheduled for Earth Day this year on April 22nd. We've got lots of partners engaged. The out-of-school program will be engaged with that. The Student Climate Action Council is very excited to be a part of it. We've got many other MCPS offices as well as county government agencies like Department of Environmental Protection and others, and also county nonprofits such as Habitat for Humanity. It's, it's, it's going to be even better than the November 1st event that we had. Um, and we're also seeking some grant and external funding to be able to do more than just the basic urban form to try to develop it into a sustainability demonstration hub. So um, it's the first of many projects that we have to have moving forward to educate the students about environmental action in a different way than they've experienced in the past. Yep. And I do appreciate the fact that we are, um, we are providing all these opportunities and I'm going to give a shout out to Mr. Mr. Traubman in your office, who's just a visionary in this work, doing such great things. But we're providing opportunities for direct action for the students. Not only are we bringing them in um, to learn more about the work we're doing, partnering with them in, in you know, uh, publicizing the work and things like that, but we're also providing them the opportunity to be directly a part of the work. And that, I think, is one of the ways um, that it really solidifies for the students that every we can all take action, and every little action means if we all take a little action, we are collectively taking a really big action. And I really do appreciate the way that the, these projects are, are providing that for our students, and they can. This is work that they can see, and that I think is really important. And, and I agree with you. The, the ability to take action is one of the most important parts about climate change. It's one thing to talk about it; it's another thing to do something. So giving our students that chance to feel and to actually really contribute, because I've seen some, some very amazing synergies um, when the students get involved. So thank you so much for supporting them. Yeah, and I will be there on the Earth Day. I can't wait. Super. This is going to be a great day. Um, 
And I will ask Mrs. Mondrowski if she has any questions before we move on to the next thing. Or I, I don't have any questions. I just want to associate myself with the comments of my colleagues and just tell you all how excited I am that you guys are doing this and we're making great progress. Um, and I know that there are other areas of reusable energy that we can be looking into going forward. And I look forward to all the chances we have to do everything that we can. So thank you for your work. Yeah, awesome. Okay, now moving on to um, something that was uh, briefly mentioned uh, in our uh, offering budget conversation, but uh, we're gonna get an update on our human capital management uh, system. And we, this has been a, I will let um, the experts here uh, be more specific, but this has been a multi-year, multi-phasic project that I remember being discussed eight years ago or so when I was um, uh, in, in Montgomery County Council PTAs on the executive committee, sitting in operating budget, um, uh, you know, on the advisory group for the superintendent and talking about how antiquated our business systems and our technology systems were and how that was, um, it was, it was costing our system in many ways, efficiency, dollars, and so we made the investment and are moving forward with that work. Again, it's work that um, people don't really see, but they might experience it. And, and I think um, when we get rid of those paper timesheets, you know, people can't believe in 2024 that the Montgomery County Public Schools employees still fill out paper timesheets, but they do, so yes. Good morning, Ms. Harris and committee members. My name is Kimberly Fields. I'm the IT Director for Business Information Services. Today, I will be providing a high-level overview about the Human Capital Management Project. Throughout this presentation, you will hear me reference the Human Capital Management Project as the HCM Project. And also, before I begin, I want to ensure our viewers and those in attendance understand the purpose of a human capital management system. HCM is the core record keeping system for our critical HRIS transactions. It's a platform such as this will allow us to further um, continue to better manage various elements such as payroll, time and attendance, onboarding our employees, benefits management, compensation planning, workforce planning, just to name a few. The new HCM platform will lead to an increased efficiency while continuing to adhere to legal, regulatory and compliance requirements. And as Ms. Harris has stated, the system will be replacing our current HRIS system of 20 plus years. Next slide, please. So this is a critical enterprise-wide cross-departmental project that is involving various offices and departments, such as ERSKI, such as the Department of Business Information Services, the Office of Human Resources and Development, the Controller's Office, the Investment Office, Transportation, um, Department of Professional Growth Systems, OSI System-wide Professional and Learning, IT, just to name a few. Um, throughout this implementation, we are wanting to be thoughtful of all users of the system, assessing the various business needs and impacts based on the new system. The project team and the project sponsors continue to do their part in performing their due diligence and being able to launch this system in December of 2024. And as you all know, we are in the process of implementing a new cloud-based HCM platform that will improve our business processes. It will modernize our current system as well as being able to upgrade our technology. The continuous, um, this platform allows for us to be able to continuously update and stay in compliance, um, avoid costly upgrades that could potentially occur throughout the year. We're enhancing our security, which is so critical, um, adding to our infrastructure, looking at best practices, looking at enhancing those reporting, as well as the analytical capabilities for our central offices and to be able to provide those additional ports. Um, again, as I said, being able to improve cross-departmental business processes, this system also allows for us to be able to scale up and scale down. What does it look like from a maintainability and sustainability? We're going to be able to better manage and retain our employees, also from a maintenance standpoint as well. Next slide, please. 
So we've taken a three-phased approach um, in implementing the ERP systems, which is Enterprise Resource Planning Systems. As Mr. Riley mentioned, we have been successfully using the Business Hub, which launched in 2020, and we are now implementing phase one of two phases for the HCM platform. And I just want to remind everyone, the HCM implementation began May of 2022. So from 2017 to 2020, that was the implementation of our financial business hub, which has launched. And then from 2021 to 2024, this is our HCM phase one. Um, phase one, just for everyone, awareness that was uh, RFP bid number 4455.1 which was the Oracle budget and financial solution and for phase two which is our HCM that was under a different RFP bid which was 4923.1 and so in thinking about and looking at our HCM phase one what does that include that's our payroll that's our time in attendance that's our absence that's our self-service our compensation what is our position management um, so all those various items are going into our phase one, those elements that we are currently working on as we speak. And phase two is primarily focused on our HR side of the house, which is the recruitments and the certifications, um, performance evaluations, as well as it relates to licensing. And that will begin in 2025 and targeting to be over in 2026. The total cost under the 4923.1 with the extension is $21.9 million, and the extension of the go-live date was initially um, December of 2023, and it now will be going live December of 2024. And, and, oh, go ahead. and just um, in, in the interest of transparency, share um, why, because um, we have heard some mm -hmm. questions about why the delay, um, why the, the uh, extension. Yes, so the reason for the 12 months extension was based upon allowing us to be able to address certain challenging um, solutioning that was going on that was going to impact the business. Also, the customization and configuration, the testing, um, making sure we're getting our security right as well. We had some additional resource challenges related to um, attrition on our project as well. And also, we needed to make sure we had additional time built in for our training and development to make sure that we're training our users because this is 30,000 users that plus because our retirees would be able to use the system as well. And I see uh, Ms. Mondrowski has her hand up, so I'll let her oh, ask yes. a question. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this is a very uh, big issue um, for me because, you know, we've been working on this for years and it's cost us millions of millions of dollars. And my question really is, there have been a lot of um, delays and um, extensions and added money to this project from when I first raised my hand about it. Um, and I'm curious as to what we are doing to ensure that December of 2024 is actually the launching date. Because, I mean, are we getting some money back? Are we charging them fees or how is it working? Because I feel like I've been We've been working on this for six or eight, uh, no, probably eight to 10 years now. And as I said, you know, year after year, it seems like we end up needing to put more money in. And I wanna know when my, when our employees will be able to get their paychecks done in a way where they can have the option of getting paid 12 months out of the year as opposed to 10, if that's the type of employee that they are. So just for clarification, um, this was a three-phased project. So the first phase was the ERP, because I know there was mention of this going on for seven to eight years. That was initially under the first RFP. Then the second RFP came within 2021, which was related to the human capital management project. And this is a two-phased project. And so, no, we have actually taken a look at various gaps that we needed to fill. We were able to address them with the assistance of our sponsors and our senior executive leadership, such as Mr. Hall and as well as Mr. Riley, to be able to um, 
ensure that we're going to go live on, in December of 2024. It is critical that we get this system up and running um, to be able to transition off because our current vendor is sunsetting the version of our current HRIS system that we're on. Oh, Can I just add to, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. so I had mentioned before, so um, it might be a little confusing because it seems like one elongated project, but we have reaped the benefits of that first business hub section. Um, and uh, you know those those efficiencies don't happen once you go live. We're reaping those benefits now as better reporting, uh, better workflow. Um, so from an accounting standpoint, not necessarily getting rid of paper timesheets, but we have uh, um, experienced great efficiencies through that process of that first phase, as well as I mentioned the budget phase as well too, which was another uh, previous uh, phase prior to HCM. I do want to associate myself with the comments from Mrs. Swarovski that if we have a target day of December 24 to have this uh, be alive for our employees, there should be some accountabilities from our business partners to deliver that. And it should be some accountability within ourselves to manage the project, so to ensure that date is the date, right? Uh, and 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 um, so that uh, because uh, I came on the board when the extension cost uh, uh, was uh, in discussion. So um, that remain one of my concerns uh, that this can be going on. Uh, we have talked about additional uh, support uh, from the system. And so um, what will happen if it's not that we have to be clear? So but I'm. I'm confident, sounds like you are putting great emphasis on managing this project, and then we hope and that this will come to fruition as it is planned. And, and I'll just add, too, that um, since Ms. Fields joined the school system and, you know, last year when we uh, realized that it just was not going to be done uh, by December 31st of this past school year and what we needed to do to get it back on track. Um, and so we have done a number of things. Uh, obviously, Ms. Fields and her team meet regularly with uh, the vendor. Um, we have set up monthly meetings uh, where to the best of my ability, I attend uh, and meet uh, regularly with them also to make sure that we're on track. And we've had some very uh, frank conversations with them about what our expectations are and what our needs are, and that is to uh, be ready to go live by the end of this calendar year. Uh, we've also added some staff. Uh, some of the delays weren't necessarily all on the vendor's part, um, but on our internal capacity, because we've got people doing uh, their current jobs, making sure that people get paid and time is recorded correctly in the current system. At the same time, these same people are the ones testing out the new system and running all these different scenarios to make sure that we basically have tried and done everything that could possibly happen in the new system. And so it's additional work on top of people's already full-time jobs. And so we have added capacity uh, to make sure that we have, um, you know, the, the people in the right places to get the job done by the time that we've stated. Uh, what what? I'm sorry. I, I, go ahead, I, uh, Mrs. Small Johnson. Go ahead. I just want to sit, uh, Brian. I really, really appreciate that. Um, as I know you know are aware, you know I I won't raise my hand anymore for additional funding on this project without some sort of guarantee that it's actually going to be finished. So I'm I'm very appreciative um, of the additional efforts that you're making. I want us to be able to tell people that. You know, there's a timeline that they can have an expectation to be followed and that it is followed. So thank you. Um, I want to ask about, I think it's still early, but I, I'm sure you are thinking about it. One of the things as a staff member in the system, you talk about 30,000 people or more. So that training will need to be very big production and it need to be thoughtful, um, process because I don't think it's a, a email that will be able to train everyone uh, on on switching to to use so um, uh, would that be something that if you maybe if you have a plan I think I would appreciate uh, hearing about the plan uh, a bit ahead of time how are we going to educate our staff about the switch Actually, in the future have something related to the training and with that uh, plan high level um, okay. in the presentation. 
Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Next slide. We're on slide four, yes. Thank you. So this is truly an investment in the future um, from a technology standpoint that's going to benefit all users. And as you can see, purposely, we wanted to make sure you saw a laptop, you saw a tablet, you saw a mobile device, because this is going to be a responsive user interface design for our employees. We're trying to make it very user-friendly and, and intuitive, right, based upon what it is that we're delivering. We're also not just looking at our general users, our functional users. We're also looking at what is the impact from a central office standpoint. We're ensuring that we will have that single sign-on. We're making sure that our various applications that are integrating within into the platform are seamless as well. Um, and then we also have different cross applications because we are currently connecting about 60 plus different applications into our system that are being transferred over from our current HR um, record keeping system. And I do appreciate this because um, when you say intuitive, um, because the use of technology is not a universal talent. And, and we have, you mentioned it before, this isn't just current employees, retirees are also going to be using this. So making sure that we have truly user-friendly interface um, is incredibly important. And I appreciate what you said about um, some of our staff time uh, internally is being used to, to beta test this programming as we go along so that we don't get, get, get a product that we say is ready to go. Then we're testing it and finding issues and problems and bugs, but we're doing that, that that process on an ongoing basis, which is important. So I just, as I look at this, wondering, how are we bringing in our end users to help beta test these um, interfaces to make sure that they really do, um, they really are intuitively usable for our most tech savvy and our least tech savvy? So with that, uh, we currently just finished our 10 week system integration testing where our vendor was actually on site four days a week with our um, our project team to make sure that we're testing, we're understanding the system, we're understanding what potential customizations or personalizations that we've made in the platform to be able to, and also comparing, what do we currently have in our system? Are we losing any benefit when we really should be gaining those different benefits within the new platform? So we also uh, are testing to make sure our payroll is right. Um, things such as that, and then we are also getting ready to go back into another system integration testing, and then I would say around our user acceptance testing to be able to allow people to see, okay, what is the experience going to be like? What does that look like? Um, and then at the same time, and running in parallel, because this is a very complex, massive project that we're working on, is to also make sure we're communicating out, which I'm going to talk a little bit about as well. Yeah, and I think that's important because, I mean, Change is also hard, even when you're changing to something that's that's, that's far more efficient, far more user-friendly. Um, so we may still have people out there that are really anxious that you're taking away their Model T, you know, and um, putting them in a Tesla. So how we are managing that experience for people um, Absolutely. is important. Next slide, please. So I wanted to be able to share with you some benefits and value added. What are we actually getting for the amount of money um, that we have invested. So as you know, right now we have our business hub, but that business hub will now be integrated within the same platform as our human capital management system. Um, Ms. Harris, you had mentioned earlier and Ms. Yang about 10 month pay, being able to elect to be paid over 12 months. That would start in July of FY 2025 to be able to start off a new school year, okay? Online timesheets, being able to transition away from the paper and be able to approve and use online timesheets for the system to better be more efficient and effective in how we're managing our time and putting and inputting. Also, the new hire benefits enrollment will be based on the hire date instead of that one targeted date we have to allow employees to health benefits sooner. Next slide, please. Actually, oh, go ahead. Sorry, can we mm -hmm. Just one thing on this side, just for a point of uh, clarification. Um, if we could go back to the previous slide. On bullet number two here, it says starting in July FY25. It's July of 2025, which will be the beginning of FY26. So I just oh, want to be clear about thank that. You. 
Next up. Thank you. Um, providing salary information notices to confirm salary and position information. You'll see a big change, especially on their self-service. Right now, users have to log in individually to every single aspect, such as being able to look at your e-pay stubs, your leave balances, your benefits, your salary information, all different logins. You're using your same login, but you have to come out and log back in. This is all in the same system, which is a huge plus for our employees. Also, MCFS will be able to attract the 10-month employees prepaid health benefit deductions using an escrow account and through an automated process and be able to refund upon termination and retirement, which is a shift as well. So I wanted to be able to share some of those added benefits and value um, that would be most important, especially to our employees and our viewers. There are additional, but we just wanted to keep it very high level today. And just a question um, that occurs to me. So one of the issues that has come up over the past 18 months or so, is uh, looking at our retirees and their their health benefits and how um, retirement dates and and the way MCPS with you know pays for or withdraws um, uh, health insurance premiums has there there was like a six week di disconnect so you know retirees were paying you know 400 or so dollars for covers they didn't really have because of the 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 dates of their end of service is this system going to correct for that as well yeah that that's another one of the benefits as you mentioned about 18 months ago we realized that um some retirees were making prepayments on health insurance uh the this system avoids that so we're, we're correcting that manually currently uh, but once we're fully into hcm uh, that problem goes away I have a question about the bullet. MCPS will be able to track 10 months employee pay, prepay health benefit. Is this what we are talking about, the flexible spending account, or this is something different? I believe that the, this bullet goes to what they were just talking about as far as um, when employees are paying for their uh, their health insurance in advance, and then if they were to retire in the middle of the summer before they realized that full amount, uh, previously that money just kind of sat there and they didn't get it back. This will allow us to uh, timestamp their, their date of retirement or leaving the district and then refund any of those monies. Okay, but this is, the system doesn't allow the integration of the FSA, the flexible spending account, for employee to see the balance or Oh, it would, would not have that function. We still have to log into the, um, the flexible spending upon vendors. Voya right now is the system using to, to get that information. Am I correct? Yeah, I don't believe the intention is to integrate that. That is still going to be separate. Is that correct? <laughs> we will still have to view, uh, log into Voya to see the balances of the flexible spending. Okay, thank you. I just, I'd like to introduce uh, Gina Rapoli, the director of uh, Erski and Ella Bradley, too, are, who are key components in helping the success of this Appreciate initiative. Your work. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about the communications, because we do have a communication plan. What does that look like and how we're going to target for our launch in December 2024? And just listing a couple of the areas we thought about was... Uh, for instance, IT wire, communication network. What does this look like for in-person and virtual presentations, letting people know using online learning, different QR codes that was brought to our attention, um, administrative broadcast email. We're also thinking about timekeeper trainings, right? Because timekeepers would need to be trained, presentations at PLCs, um, in service days, uh, communicating with the union's executive leadership, which we have been doing to try and keep them informed, and also involving OSI district-wide communications department. So we really are trying to take an approach of trying to be very inclusive when it comes down to our training, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Wow. Okay. Um, one of the things I think uh, a strong partner have, we have a retiree association, okay. and, and they actually do quarterly luncheon for our retirees. And I actually have the pleasure to attend some of these. And uh, it might be helpful if uh, set up a table, a booth, or do a little presentation right there to help our retiree and, and, and you know, work with them ahead of time so they have a 
usually is very well attended, so they might have an even bigger attendance for that event. Also, we, at the end of the year, we have a celebration for our retire for our system employee that's going into retirement. That might be a time to say what you might expect the change, right? Uh, how would you assess the system? Then now you are a retiree. So just some thought about outreach to our our retirees. No, thank you so much for sharing. And it's noted, we definitely want to make sure we're being inclusive. And if we're missing any groups, we want people to be able to tell us so we can make sure we're targeting and getting that information to them. Yeah, and I do have a meeting later this week with um, one of the officers of the Employee Retirement Association. Maybe I put this on her radar and connect the two of you um, for coming up with strategic opportunities yes. to really share this information um, with at least, you know, at in-person events that will attract our current and uh, immediately upcoming retirees won't necessarily get to, we don't, all of our retirees don't live here anymore, but um, so we'll definitely need the other methods as well, but that's um, a good way, and I appreciate Ms. Yang raising that, that we have baked into uh, this ongoing calendar events that are going to attract the audience that you want to talk to, so. No, I definitely appreciate you both sharing that information and it's noted and I will probably follow up offline um, to obtain some additional information, so thank you. Yeah. Um, supporting our end users training, Ms. Yang, you had mentioned this before, and so we recognize the importance of being able to train our 30,000 plus users and we're working with OSIR district-wide communications department in developing the training plan. The change management team has created a collaborative work group framework that includes four stages, as you can see on this presentation. Discover, collaborate, engage, and deliver. As you can see on the screen, we are currently in our discovery phase, and this process is designed to promote a cyclical and evolving nature of cross-team collaboration while providing um, a structure that offers guidance and support and existing best practices for the launch. So especially in being able to target groups such as like building services or transportation or our facilities. Um, and in reviewing and creating training, we also want to ensure that equity and inclusion, as I stated earlier, in addressing a multitude of adult learning styles because we know all people do not learn the same. And the training approach offers um, a variety of training options to be able to meet the diverse needs of MCPS employees, including, for instance, instructor-led, in-person or live online, self-paced, on-demand, drop-in office hours, as well as access to an in-help um, library guides that we're going to make sure people will have access to. Then, of course, you have your videos, your crosswalks, and much more. So, again, we're in our discover phase, and we are trying to make sure we are not leaving anyone out because it's really important that we want to make sure people can adjust to the system accordingly. This is a change that um, people are going to have to pivot from what they are used to from 20 plus years to now changing to something that's more modernized and just making sure that we're providing that level of comfort as well. So thank you. And I think the next slide was just discussion if you had any questions. I don't have any further question. I just want to make a comment. My daughter worked in the health industry, right? And, and she showed me on her phone, she has an app. When she uh, uh, entered the building, she swipe it. When she leave the building, she swipe it again. And that's how, that, that there's no paper time shit. That, that's how they keep track of her time, right? And so um, it is, time to modernize uh, our system. So thank you for your work in this area. And, and I'll just add as a piece of commentary, um, when I first started, you know, a year and a half or so ago, uh, Mr. Riley came into my office and handed me a piece of paper and I looked at it and I looked at him and I said, Rob, what is this? He said, oh, this is a timesheet. <laughs> yes, is it? 1922? 2022. Um, and I'll ask Ms. Mondrowski if she has any additional questions before we move on. No, I'm great. Thank you. Okay. And All right. Can thank I just you. say a big thank you to Ms. Fields, Mr. Riley, um, Ms. Key, um, Ella Bradley, Gina Rapoli, and everybody in HR and finance and IT that are doing all of this work. It's a, it's a big lift. It is. Yeah, and I, I also appreciate that work because it is, um, again, it gets to and I think oftentimes this area of the work gets 
both underappreciated and under um, under attended to, because people historically think of schools or schools, and that's where kids go to learn. They don't think about the fact that it's also a business, and and the fact that we are now. Um, moving ourselves into the 21st century with industry best practices is incredibly important t for many, many reasons. But um, and so I, I definitely appreciate the work you're doing. And I will say too, this just the work that you all do actually highlights one of my um, things that I say to, to students in the system all the time when I say, please think about coming back to MCPS as you build your career because we don't just hire teachers. You know, we hire people that do this finance work, this accounting work, this benefits work. Um, and it's all important to how we create a system people want to work in, a, people that make, a system that makes people feel appreciated, and that performs. And so, um, yes, very much appreciate the work that you do. Thank you all for your time today. All right, yay, people are so excited about the next thing we are going to be talking about. I'm not making that up. There are you know, several of the things Ms. Edwards is here to talk about that have been um, gotten a lot of attention and interest um, that, that are, again, not things that happen in our classrooms. I think that very much affect the, the, the experience of people with our system writ large. And that gets to how um, the, our, the electrification of our fleet how we transport people back and forth, how we are working to make that process more sustainable, uh, more climate friendly, more user friendly. And so, um, yes, very excited to hear what you all have to present today. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Good afternoon. Good, almost good morning. <laughs> like four minutes away. Good morning. I'm Dana Edwards. I'm the Chief of District Operations. Would like to thank the committee for having Michael Lewis, Acting Director of Transportation, um, with us today. Um, it's, it's funny that we come after HCM as we talk about coming into this century. If you remember last week at the budget work session, one of the things I just said was we're catching up. You know, we are really kind of pulling ourselves up and really looking at maybe either where we have some practices of old that we needed to have, but now we realize that to really kind of keep us in this century and to remain marketable um, outside of MCPS, that we definitely need to look at our systems. So like you said, today we'll talk to you about um, uh, the transportation study. We will also talk about the electrification of the fleet and talk about where we are with that. I think that's this is a great time to do that because we came to the board, I think, in the fall um, around a contract for diesel, and we talked a little bit last week. Um, and then we'll kind of close out with our bus app. So um, thank you for the opportunity. One of the big things um, I talked about last week was just really kind of being strategic in the Department of Transportation, understanding what we needed to do. We even um, looked at what our mantra is. And so we've moved our mantra to moving the future. Um, and that was a collective um, and collaborative discussion with all of the transportation staff to really kind of get us to that point um, and really thinking about a couple of key areas that you'll hear that we threaded through the transportation study, our operations, our fleet, safety training, and just the holistic budget because that will drive all of those key things. But from pickup to drop off, safety and efficient operations and operational excellence really remain at the core. We know we're the first classroom, we're the first face, we set the tone for many students. Um, you know, the, the, the conversations that our bus operators as well as our aides have with our children are really, really important. Um, and we'll talk to you a little bit around the type of program that we run that is very different than other counties um, here in the state of Maryland. And I think that's important to be able to identify. But we appreciate just kind of this holistic conversation with you. Um, and really, I think as we reimagine and kind of recalibrate ourselves for post-COVID transportation, it's really important just to keep the conversation going. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Lewis at this point um, to share some uh, broader information around just the actual logistics in the work. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Edwards, and thank you, Ms. Harris, Ms. Mandrowski, and Ms. Yang for allowing me the honor and privilege to be here today. Before I kick off with some very high-level stats about this awesome department, I wanted to recognize that all of our operators and our, our attendants are actually participating in their winter in-service right now, which is a Code of Maryland regulation, which requires a certain number of hours for which our drivers and our attendants must remain certified in order to operate and then also ride with our special education students. So over 1,200 of our awesome drivers and attendants are currently participating in an online version um, of our in-service. So that brings us to the awesome statistics because I think it's very, very, very important for the folks here in the room and for those who are watching to really understand the magnitude and enormity of our operations. And I want to highlight Ms. Yang who visited our Shady Grove Depot the other week and I think we had a great opportunity to share the ins and outs of what we do but also the complexities around our daily operations. So currently, Department of Transportation has over 2,000 permanent and substitute employees, the bulk of which are um, made up of our drivers and our attendants. We have currently 1,418 buses on the road, of which 206 are electric. We have 1,184 bus routes, and I think it's also important to make sure people remember that it's not just a singular bus route from your child's bus stop to school. It's likely that bus also services two to four other schools, both morning and afternoon. Our buses travel collectively over 100,000 miles per day, and they're housed at five depot footprints with seven actual depot operations. And we support over 230 public schools within Montgomery County, and we also support non-public school transportation for our special education students in the Washington, D.C. area, down to Virginia, and we also have weekend operations to support our compensatory services, our George P. George B. Thomas Learning Academy, and also our non-publics, the Maryland School for the Deaf and the Blind. So just to give folks an idea of how far we go and how often we go, it's a seven-day-a-week job. And as Ms. Edwards stated before, we do have our new mantra, which is moving our future. And I wanted to quickly share the mission statement before we get into the rest of our time today, and that is that the dedicated staff of the Department of Transportation will provide safe, reliable, and equitable access to transportation so all students may achieve educational success and academic excellence. DOT staff is committed to maximizing resources, incorporating sustainable practices, and continuously engaging all stakeholders to create and maintain integrity and reliability to gain the trust of Montgomery County students and their families. So thank you. Oh, nope. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I appreciate um, uh, Mr. Lewis sharing that because it does align with the work that we often see in schools with the school improvement plan. And it was important for transportation to be able to do that. So we want to talk a little bit about the electrification of our fleet. Um, and so there were some shifts that we did make and we talked about that in the fall. We did order more diesel buses in the fall for a couple of reasons, and the main reason was the delivery time frame of our electric buses. In addition, we also needed to procure special education buses, which are a smaller bus type than our regular size buses that seat about 66 students. And our, um, our company that we have been working with, they were not at the point where they were making the special education buses. And so we wanted to make sure that we could meet the demand of what our students needed and what we saw we needed in the future to be able to do that. So I'd like for um, Mr. Uh, Lewis was to talk about the deployment schedule that we have. I will say that since we have been here to really discuss around the shift in what we were looking at with the fleet, a couple of key factors in terms of what we have been doing. We have, we have really solidified our communication structure with Highland Fleet, who is the company that we work with. Um, the transportation team meets with them every single week to look at where the orders are, what we need. Today for the end service, they actually have a video, and we really take this seriously in terms of the professional development that all of the staff have around electric buses. Because when it comes time for someone to switch from a diesel to electric, we want that comfort to be there. And what we know is that they are definitely quieter, um, which is a plus, but as a driver, it's like, well, where's the noise um, outside? Of, you know, all, all you hear is kids, so we want to be able to create that base. We also want to be able to create the professional 
professional opportunities for our mechanics who work on those buses as well. Um, we do have our own mechanic bays, and it's important that we provide those staff the PD that they need and the support in this transition. The second piece is that Mr. Hall and I do bi-weekly meetings as well with the leadership of Highland Fleet as well so that we're actually problem solving any other components and we're thinking about the future. The most critical part that we know is that we did that contract several years ago, about maybe three or four years ago. And so as that contract starts to come to an end, things have changed. And we want to make sure that we understand the scope and the landscape of what clean buses look like at this moment. What are other districts doing? Um, because even though we lead all districts in the United States, we want to make sure that we're leading in the right way. <laughs> you know, and we're leading with the right companies. So we are in a request for information um, um, opportunity right now where we are learning what the current landscape is. We're learning around different components of what clean buses look like. So when we move to write the RFP, we're targeted and we're pinpointed and we're not wasting anyone's time or hours because of just the length of time it takes to make buses. And I do want to just make a comment because I, I have gone to many um, industry webinars looking at um, helping systems electrify, finding grants, finding funding opportunities, things like that. And what, what has really struck me is the way MCPS is so far out in front on this issue. Um, how we, and one of the things too, as I look across the country at systems that are looking to electrify, um, the approach we've taken has been one that's been very um, integrated and one that's very um, RFP, this is the contract, this is, you know, this is the funding stream, this is how we're going to make this work, where most other systems that I've talked to are doing it in a very piecemeal way. It's like a, like a patchwork quilt. I'm going to get a, a, you know, looking for a grant over here to get maybe five buses and partnership with this industry over here, maybe get another one, whereas we have a contract, an ongoing contract to, to get us to, to hundreds of buses. And, and um, it is not, I am not, this isn't hyperbole to say, when I've been to some of these webinars and engaged with transportation directors of other systems, and they've been talking about how well they're doing to electrify, and I'll say, well, how many electric buses do you have? And they'll say, oh, we've got 15. And I'm like, hmm, okay. I have 206. We have more. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and it, but it just gets to the approach and that how we, and again, and I, Mr. Hall and I have had this conversation, you know, the first one through the wall gets a little bit bloody. And we have been not only on the cutting edge, but sometimes on the bleeding edge of, of this technology. But it does go to where we need to go as a system, as a county. Um, these electric vehicles are the future. And so, you know, we have, we are, all in, and so when and we are, um, we really are um, way out front on this. And I and I, I, our students in particular are are very very appreciative. And sometimes students will say, "Well, I don't, you know, I I never see a diesel bus, or I, I never see an electric bus." And I said, "Well, how would you know? Because they don't look. I mean, unless you've got a tape measure, they don't really look different. But and I'll say, look, you'll know because a you don't hear it. And they also don't smell. So that's how you know. You're not going to be able to look a bus driving down the street and say, oh, that's what kind of bus is that? Um, Maybe we do need to brand them. We talked about that. And there was, a, there was, a, there was actually a state regulation about what you can put. Because I said, let's put a big, let the students design a big magnet to put on the sides of buses. It's actually state regulation that says you can't do that, that regulates what you can put on the side of a, of a, of a school bus. But um, we still got to think of something. Maybe how we, you know how we have numbers? Can we add a number E, e. or whatever yeah. in front of it? I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, um, thank you. Thank you for, uh, I think I'm also very uh, excited to talk about um, electrify our bus fleet. I recently switched my own vehicle from uh, gasoline vehicle to uh, electric vehicle and, and just loving it. Despite my children's concern about my handling of technology, <laughs> I'm doing really well and, and really like it a lot. And I appreciate the opportunity to visit our bus depot. 
and to see uh, the men and women who oftentimes that we don't recognize that they are an essential part of keeping our school system operate and having a good academic outcome. They are an essential component of our work. Um, now, um, uh, we talking about we are being the leading district in uh, this conversion from diesel to electric, uh, uh, electric buses, I would like you to share about some of the challenges, right, that we faced uh, and uh, doing this this process, so that we uh, and our partners at different uh, government levels and and community can better support us to do this very important work. Um, I think so. First, I want to uh, thank. Um, Ms. Harris for bringing the part that it's a strategy you have to have especially for um, a transportation um, organization our size. Um, you will talk to some of the other districts who say half of our fleet is electrified where they have 20 buses they have 10 you know so but they still have to determine how they move forward. I will say when we talk about the good part is we're on the right path. One of the biggest challenges I would say is that a lot of the work and a lot of the vision around this took place pre-pandemic. And so when we started it was we're going to do 100% of our fleet. And doing 100% of our fleet sounded great. Um, it was a great forecast to really think about, but then the reality of the implementation is what we had to think about. And implementation from a couple of levels. One, um, at the beginning, Mr. Lewis talked about just the number of miles that we traverse, the type of terrain our buses go through. We have um, urban parts of Montgomery County, we have suburban parts, we have rural parts, and we also have students that, as, as he shared, go as far as northern almost Baltimore County into Virginia that we, that we travel with. So we, have, we want to be mindful of that. And not to say, and I want to be clear about this because I don't want people to say, oh my gosh, are you saying that the buses won't charge that long? That's not what I'm saying. But we also have to bear that component in mind. I would say another challenge I would I would bring forward is because we were on the we're on the cutting edge, and we use full size buses, the larger buses, and then our special education buses. Um, we also have travel buses for our athletics program and different field trips. Um, what the what the companies were making at the time did not take into account the different types of uh, travel that we needed to do for different types of students. And so some of our special ed buses have wheelchair lifts, lifts and some don't. Um, and some of them increased pounds because we're taking the, the band um, equipment and all of those different components. So that is a critical challenge that I think in terms of really thinking about 100% electrification, when we really got down into the logistics, that came up in terms of what's the balance there. And then I'll have you talk about, you know, our buses really um, timing out and just the availability. So I just wanted to elevate those that it really took a lot of thought. And the biggest part is this. Like with any of these smaller industries that we talk about, just like within transportation, um, the circle and sphere is small. And so as we do this work, we want to make sure that we have the commitment to making sure our children can get where they need to be. We're mindful of our policies, the fiduciary responsibilities, but we also remain um, aware of our, our conversations and our work with our vendors as well. Um, because again, the, the sphere is very small, but we also have to put our needs in the forefront. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. So I think uh, two of the major challenges that we continue to, to see on a regular basis is just the availability of the vehicle types, right, that we need here in Montgomery. And as our manufacturer produces prototypes for the vehicle sizes that we need, 
the performance data is not yet there, as we're the leaders to actually put these vehicles on the road, to have them collect all of this incredibly useful information one way or the other, in that the number of miles that we travel has to be sustainable for the students. And so as we um, rolled out the deployment for this school year, this was the first year of our electric vehicle deployment that we incorporated a different vehicle type into our procurement. And so Montgomery County Public Schools um, procured 10 type A electric vehicles, which are equipped with a wheelchair lift, but they are much smaller in size than our large 64 passenger um, Julies. And so we don't yet have any of those on the road. We're still accepting the deliveries um, from our vendor. However, we're doing some testing right now to see what the performance data looks like. We're having the bus run in different kinds of temperatures. Fortunately, we've had some very cold temperatures and we've had some very warm temperatures. So we're collecting the, the data and information on that so it can help inform us on what routes can actually sustain um, and accept a, uh, an EV vehicle for our special needs students. And then also, again, it's a new vehicle type for us to have a wheelchair lift. This is a 16 passenger um, vehicle. So we're also trying to find where are the efficiencies um, in, in placing buses of these vehicle type um, on particular routes. Our vendor and our manufacturer have both shared with us that the vehicle sizes that we do need are now in production. And so as we continue these weekly and biweekly conversations, we're learning more about what the makeup of that is, what the production timelines of those are, and we're hoping to then fulfill um, the remainder of our contract with a complement of some of these different vehicle types. But I think it's important for everyone to, to remember that these are, again, prototype vehicles. And as we put them to use and we are collecting this performance data and we're getting feedback, from the students and the families that get to enjoy them, these are all just elements of our entire conversation to help us inf be informed to make future decisions. Um, one of the other pieces um, that I think are challenging too is just the sort of unreliability of supply chain as it pertains to anything related to the transportation industry, not just specific to electric. And so as we have to have a complement of vehicles in order to move over 100,000 students a day, we also need to ensure that we have a spare fleet or vehicles that we know um, are reliable. And so I think that's part of our uh, rationale for the continued mixed fleet so that we know that we have have a supplemental um, bus in case something happens with the EVs. Just anecdotally, um, when we had an early release, it was challenging for our buses who are EVs to have returned from their morning routes and then get a fuller charge so that they could go back out in a very short amount of time versus the three and a half to four hour window that most get to um, recharge before their afternoon routes. So again, all of these considerations and all of these scenarios are coming into play so that we can help um, better triage them and then also help circumvent some of these challenges and be on the forefront of making sure that all of our buses are in a 100% readiness status. That's my job to make sure that every single bus is, is always ready for our students. Yeah, and I, I just want to compliment the three of you, Mr. Hall, Mr. Lewis, Ms. Edwards, because, um, you know, our, our work around this got a little bit fraught last, last fall. And uh, part of it was because um, I think, I'm just going to be candid, I think our vendors were not being uh, upfront with us. And they were saying different things to different people, and that is never a good model. And so I do appreciate the doubling down on the weekly meetings and the bi-weekly meetings with leadership to, um, so that we can, can, can be a transparent with our community, but so, but so that we are also demanding that they be transparent with us. Um, um, because I myself did not at all appreciate the mixed messages that were coming from uh, the vendor. It seemed that they were targeting their communications depending on the audience, and that is, uh, to me, not a very good business model. But I, I really do appreciate, and also the, the very comprehensive 360-degree way that we're doing this, because it is so much more complicated than, than people think. You order the bus, they deliver the bus, you drive the bus, and I'm like, not really, you know. Um, there are some intermediate steps before we, you, you, the three of you, feel comfortable putting a bus on the road to transport our students. And so um, it, it is more than people think. And I do appreciate, and I also appreciate, Ms. Edwards, you mentioned, um, th this is an industry in which, in which technology is moving very quickly. And so the RFI, uh, um, to me, that is such an important common sense thing for us to have done because, as you mentioned, Ms. Edwards, I remember um, raising my hand for this initial 
contract with Highland um, in January of 2021, my second meeting as a Board of Education member, and um, being very excited to do that. But also that, I mean, in this world, in this industry, that's, that's like, a century ago. And so really appreciate that we, if, as we continue to invest, we are investing in, in, a, in, a, in, a very, in very smart ways that are taking advantage of the way the industry is evolving. And that's not just the, the buses, it's the batteries, it's the charging infrastructure, it's, it's all of that. And so I, I just really appreciate the way, I think we are doing this work so very elegantly um, and, and intelligently. On that note, um, I strongly propose that this committee, together with the leaders here, let's, or, uh, let's arrange a conversation with our county leaders, state leaders, and environmental leaders to actually ha visit, see with our own eyes of uh, our transportation depot, our electric buses, and have a conversation about what we have done so far and what we are looking to uh, project in the future. I would l love to have that work done together. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking back to the event we did in October 22 at, at uh, WJ, and we went to the Bethesda Depot. And it's, I mean, this work has progressed so much, though, it, mm -hmm. it might be time for a little refresh on that. And I do want, as we talk about the Bethesda Depot, our Bethesda Depot manager, um, Jim Beasley, is here. So I want to thank him for being here. He was, mm -hmm. he has really been a champion from the beginning in mm -hmm. terms of integrating this. Mm -hmm. And we will follow up in terms of the, the conversation you talked about. It mm -hmm. may be of benefit to do it on an electric bus. Yeah. So you can see how quiet it is and right. experience it. Um, yeah. And then hear from those multiple perspectives. So. And I will just say, a year ago, uh, no, yeah, not quite a year ago. I supported my former teaching colleague, uh, Dr. Carrie Sikora, who teaches medical science at Sherwood now, as her clinical preceptor nurse with her students last spring. And the clinical bus that they had, and transportation is such a huge component of that medical science program because the second semester, getting students back and forth to their clinical sites is, is mission critical. And um, anyway, they had an electric bus. And the driver loved it, and the students loved it, and it was. But it was really nice for me to see that thing in operation every every day, and um, to be able to say to students, "Did you know you're riding on an electric bus?" And they're like, "What? No, huh? We thought it was awfully quiet in here." And I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah." So anyway, just really appreciate that work. So thank you for that conversation. We will transition now and talk about our transportation study. Um, and so I alluded to, I talked about it when we were in the budget work session last week um, in terms of the reason why we felt like the transportation study was needed. If we rewind to this time last year, we were starting to come out of missed bus routes. But we spent about four to five months where we were missing, um, we were not taking every child who was supposed to be taken to school. Um, and that was a tough thing to be very honest for us as a county. It was very difficult for the Department of Transportation because the only other time that the department had experienced this was when we returned from Omicron. Um, and so that was because we had a public health emergency that was impacting attendance. But we were now faced with our normal operations. We could not fully say that when you left the house every morning, there would be a bus there. The second piece goes to really thinking about, again, how are we coming into the 21st century? How do we have a world-class transportation system? And are we being responsive to the things that we see after COVID? We have continued growth of programs across the district. Um, and so that's not stopping because we have to look at what the academic needs of students are, whether it's an increase in number of students in who are receiving special education services, whether they are um, uh, 
individual programs like the program you talked about, Ms. Harris, and really thinking about who gets transported and who doesn't. This year, we started a uh, program review committee. That was that was one of the outcomes from the anti-racist audit, where what is it like thirty people from across the district, from every single department, come together, and we talk about is this a program that should be expanded or put in, and what are the things that are needed in order to kind of really make it alive. And we talk about not only just the ins and outs of the program and how students will register, but we also think about the transportation. The, the, the space needs that are associated with it and what that will and will not look like um, because we'll, look, we'll work on that holistically. And then the last thing I'll bring up in terms of really the importance of the transportation study, as we all know, stability with leadership. And so within that, in our department, we have had, and I appreciate, you know, Mr. Liu is serving as acting director, but we have had shifts in and out of different directors. And so we wanted to make sure that whoever comes into that director position, um, whoever's sitting in our depots, that we have heard from people outside um, who have done transportation work before to be able to provide us a perspective. So um, on, uh, on July 20th, the board did award the Center for Effective School Operations um, known as CESO, that might be a familiar acronym, the contract to do a comprehensive analysis of our transportation program. Um, and a big piece of that analysis is talking to staff, understanding what staff experience, what they know, how we implement things, what happens with challenges, you know, and then really having a really clear timeline of when we would receive information. Um, and so, as I shared last week, some of the critical things that we're looking at, fleet and maintenance efficiencies with the electric vehicle trans transition process. Uh, we really want to understand our white fleet, but we also want to think about the electrification process for our buses, but also the white fleet as well. Um, utilization of our routing, that operational effectiveness. Um, Ms. Harris, you and I have talked about, why is there a bus going by with 10 kids on it and another bus going by with almost 70 kids? But they're going in the same direction. Um, and so we want to be able to kind of increase what we do and do it more so on the front end. Um, safety and training measures, and then always comes down to organizational structures. And so um, as Mr. Lewis and I have our items, you know, we talk about, well, who's doing this? Where can we benchmark with? And so we rival really as a district with LA Unified, um, which is a huge system, and Broward County. No one in Maryland looks like or does what we do. No one surrounding us looks like and, and, and you know, does the things that we do. So people look to us, which is nice, but I want to make sure they're looking to us because we are in the forefront with many of the things. So we are playing catch up. Um, and I think it's a great way as we think about um, – operational efficiency and excellence um, to step back and not to use this as something of we're doing something wrong, but we want to make sure that we're offering the best quality product um, for our students as well as families and staff members. So what I would add is we're very excited for the work with the consultants and all of the information gathering and then the analysis that they're going to provide. So the project timeline that our colleagues um, from the Center for Effective School Operations has provided is they should be giving us a final report in the coming weeks as we're approaching February. That's their um, anticipated final project completion um, timeline for us. And what I'm thinking is of those results and as we have time to digest and to analyze their analysis. Um, we're hoping that can sort of dovetail off to a variety of different ways for us to start to really improve and enhance and either support the notions that we have, you know, already stated to ourselves, either through our new mission, our new mantra, et cetera, or for the areas of upgrade and improvement, what other folks we need to get in the room to help us propel those initiatives into the future. And I think it's very important to know that um, my leadership team, while it's incredibly important that the consultants were talking to them and interviewing them and getting important information, we've kind of st taken a step step back because we want a very, very, very objective, unbiased look at our department. 
believe it or not, I've been in, in transportation for almost 15 years here in Montgomery County Public Schools. So I think it's time for someone to, you know, have a different set of eyes and a different lens on it. Uh, because I love the work and I'm close to it, sometimes your blinders can be on. So we welcome this opportunity um, for the study and then the subsequent enhancements and recommendations that um, they're going to bring. So. Um, I have a few clarification questions. First of all, for this study, which um, going to wrap up in the next few weeks, uh, would it come with recommendations? Yes. So some of the functional areas that Ms. Edwards had shared around our fleet, our EV status, operational, organizational structure, our routing, all of those are sort of umbrellas of the areas that they're looking into to provide us recommendations. Would the study be benchmarking our school district to similar other school districts? I would say that in my experiences and conversations thus far, there is an element of benchmarking, but also just from an industry-wide perspective. Um, and then some of the other um, umbrellas below that, just from a financial and fiscal responsibility, as well as effectiveness and, and um, efficiencies. OK. And so maybe some industry-wide. OK. Another question. Uh, as we digest and look at the uh, study, um, are we thinking about uh, impacting services for the FY25 uh, school year or, or, or further or not? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Ms. Yang, um, because every time when, mm -hmm. when any study is done, people are like, oh my mm -hmm. God, the recommendations, and it's going to happen immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that will be really important is to look at what are short-term, immediate short-term and long-term. And things that would be uh, um, short, uh, immediate would be we have to act on this right now. And that mm. could be something very small. It mm. could be about how we are, um, you know, even sharing around the bus app. They're going to come and they're going to give us some information like that because they've worked with other districts. When we talk about long term, these are going to be things that impact programs, students, and staff. Mm -hmm. And we want to be mindful of what that looks like. If we don't get the information until February, mm -hmm. we're going to have to really, um, one, in preparation for the coming year, um, but also think about how we engage people who it will impact as well. An example I'll use, last week we talked about the 513 or 531 magnet routes that we have. And um, magnet transportation in, in Montgomery County Public Schools is something that we have done for a very long time, mm -hmm. as well as transportation to different programs. Um, and not all programs get transportation mm -hmm. or they get modified transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we do have to ask ourselves for if that, um, and Dr. McKnight highlighted this, if that is putting a strain on the daily operations, then what does that mean? If it is something that is a recommendation, or even in terms of how we even plan our routes holistically from the consultant, then, and uh, Mr. Lewis knows this, then what feedback do we need to go, then need to think about and look at the plus deltas in order to determine where this recommendation falls in terms of rollout. We also know that transportation, and, and as a a very proud upcoming kindergarten parent next year. Um, I know um, transportation is a big thing because you plan your life around it. Yeah. The bus is coming at nine o'clock, so I'm going to mm. wait with you and then I can go and I'll mm. be to work at this time. Mm. And so we recognize that for families, it is a communication tool that we will have to think about. So what I would, would like to do is once we get the recommendations and kind of really think about where they're bucketed, I don't know if this is a conversation to come back to this yes. committee yes. Um, and to have that and to think about what the next steps are, mm -hmm. because each one of them will be layered with next steps. But mm -hmm. I do want the work also to go back to the transportation department, because I don't want people to feel as though this is something that's being done to them. Mm -hmm and without their say-so and input. So, um, you know, we, we, will, we will weave through kind of a rollout that will be there. I really appreciate um, uh, this conversation because when we talk about choice programs, CTE programs, uh, people apply to these programs uh, early 
in December, January, February, right? Assuming the with the information that's provided at the time. So families typically have to make plans a year ahead of time uh, for what's coming up. So uh, whatever we do, we need to take into consideration of the timeline for that will impact our families. So, um, so uh, and may I add, Ms. Yang, when the programs are being rolled out, mm -hmm. um, for this year, we have not expanded any additional transportation services, mm -hmm. primarily because, as I said, it would almost be negligent on our part mm -hmm. because we are in a study mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. to really mm -hmm. do that. Right. Um, in addition, we also know pre-K is a priority for the right. district right. and for our children. Mm -hmm. And we also know that one of the very more significant, the Northwood move, mm -hmm. where typically we don't have a whole school that we are transporting. We can do some yeah. augmentation, but this is legitimately creating almost, mm -hmm. um, I would say what, almost 10, 10 additional routes. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at about 18 to 20 additional routes that we'll put on the road so that all Northwood students will have transportation to the Woodward Center. Thank you. And we also have her uh, from um, uh, one of the continual topic is a later start time for our uh, high school students. I understand that's not in the scope of this transportation study, but I think we need to bear in our minds uh, that... Uh, that might also impact um, what capacity we have as a system to handle uh, uh, that issue. And I just uh, so appreciate um, this. As I just look at the um, the <clears throat> department study that uh, facilities and operations did several years ago and how that has really revolutionized that work. And I, I love my, I don't have it in my hand, I usually do. My, the, the, so that to the point that, you know, in the early, in one of our first uh, Board of Education meetings for this academic year, we got the, the FY24 operations plan, the facilities management plan to show every, how MCPS was, was if making that work so much more efficient. And um, this, I see, is just another way that we are looking to be, um, to take the resources we have and, and make them, and use them in the most efficient way possible, get the biggest bang that we can for our, our buck. And um, I would love the idea, Ms. Edwards, of you all coming back to the Fiscal Management Committee, because this gets to the heart of operational excellence. Um, every way, you know, customer satisfaction, efficiency, safety, all of it. Um, if, you know, fiscal management, it, it, all, it wraps everything up uh, very nicely. And I just mentioned, you know, back in the, the fall of 2018, when I was um, leading MCCPTA, we were partnering or trying to partner with um, MCPS on, on a big uh, pedestrian safety initiative, safe routes and safe stops. And one of the things some of the subject matter experts in the group were saying to MCPS is you need to bring your, the way you plan and route, you know, into the 21st century. And for a variety of reasons, that didn't happen at that time. But I'm so appreciative that we are doing that work now. And um, um, because I think um, efficiencies will, you know, be a part of what we implement. And I appreciate that you're saying, too, that, that we're going to take all these recommendations and then we are going to work with staff. So it's going to be a collective, it's going to be collective work to, um, operationalize those recommendations and instead of just telling people we're going to be 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 working with them to, to come up with with the strategies that that we implement both long term and short term um, and um, and I do appreciate Ms. Yang mentioning um, I do think it's time as I said um, last Thursday night for the system to take another objective look at the start time issue and though this this study wasn't we specifically tasked to to look at that piece of this, I think it will help. It will give us information that we need and that we will build into those conversations. So very timely in many, many ways. And I, and I very much appreciate that. All right, last part. <laughs> we'll very quickly talk about our uh, tracking application. Um, and it's two phases of it. Uh, back in May, the board did award um, 
to education logistics for GPS hardware and tracking application. Um, we have used the time wisely, and I think that's very important because there were two phases to this work. One little known fact, our buses did not have GPS um, tracking on them. Yes. <laughs> like I said, we're, we're coming up <laughs> into, into this time. Um, and so that was really, really important to get that hardware installed on over 1,400 buses. Um, and so the good part is at the depot level, they, they know where all the buses are um, at any given time. At some point, it will be used to really be able to start tracking the timed arrival of buses. Um, and we know things happen. If you're in certain parts of the county, you're going to hit a lot of traffic. But does that mean we need to back something up or move? And we have that real-time data to look at patterns over time. And it's not from, and word of mouth is good, don't get me wrong, but if I'm seeing it in the moment, what are what are changes that I can make and, and really think about communicating? So that installation of the GPS was critical. And so we spent the rest of the time really looking at the integration into our system, making sure that we're being mindful of the needs around um, the single sign-on, and then really taking the time to pilot at a few of our schools to understand the experience but also the places where we really need to um, upgrade either in terms of directions, what people may need in order to use it, and then we'll move into that third part of the rollout for students to be able to utilize. Yeah, and I think um, everybody's very excited to have, and I, I don't know what the... Um, I don't want to say like the, the common name for this app will be. I know some some school systems use one call. It's called it's like get on the bus. You know, where's the bus? You know, and they just they can look at it and they know their route number. And they can look in real time. Here it here it comes or it's yeah. And I think families are really looking forward to that piece of it as it gets to what you were saying, Miss Edwards, about um, people have to plan, and if if this app will be such a benefit to our students and families in how they manage their time, their day, and how they know in real time um, where buses are and what, what to expect. Oh, I want to share, I actually, I know that you're doing a pilot right now, and actually I got an email from a parent uh, sharing her experience with this app, and I want to, it's a short email, so I want to read it out loud to let you know how people are feeling <clears throat> about the app. So I downloaded and used the new bus app, okay, and they say the interface is wonderful, and it reminds me of the map on the Uber app. <laughs> I can also see where the <clears throat> where else the buses has to go, which has instilled empathy and understanding about our bus drivers' various routes before they arrive at our homes. I love this app so much that I eagerly await the passage of the trial phase so I can use it for my high schooler as well. I guess this is an elementary school parent writing. So I just want you to know that the investment we do as a system yep. for this app, it's not a huge investment, but it's making a huge difference for our students and families. And thank you for your work in this area. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is going to be one of those things that people, when we're implemented, people are going to say that was that would have been cheap at 10 times the price. <laughs> and I want to uh, thank you, Miss Yang, for reading that um, because that pays tenfold. It just wasn't about the app, but if people can kind of see a window into the work of our bus drivers, um, you know, you have to trust th you know, them to put your kid on the bus, but then also to know all the ins and outs. Mm -hmm. I do also want to thank the team that has done tremendous work on mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and being really thoughtful around what parents see, mm -hmm. um, what they don't see, and also making this like a smooth integration. So I do want to uh, thank the team um, led by Mr. Lewis and Ms. Malchody, uh, Mr. Bonilla, and Ms. Mm -hmm. Seegers. They've just done a, a, a great job with them. Thank you. I know. Amazing.
Um, and I just, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mandowski had to drop off, but she wanted me to thank everyone for the work, and she very much appreciated the conversation today. And so, if there are any other questions, the only other thing we have on our agenda today is just um, a board expenditure report, which is just an item of information. Um, anything? Okay. So um, again, as always, I very much appreciate the work of this committee and the work of the people in the system who do this work. And um, we are, uh, our next meeting is currently scheduled for March 20th, 2024. Looking very much forward to that as well. So thank you, everybody. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>